I'm, I'm very glad to welcome you today to our live session of our workshop Geometry and Topology in Robotics, Learning, Optimization, Planning and Control, which is given um, in the context of the RSS conference. So before officially starting with the program, I just want to say a few words on, on the motivation to have the workshop. Um, so specifically, despite the, the promises and the benefits of uh, geometric and topological method, they are often overlooked by roboticists. This is due to various reasons, uh, such as the required mathematical background or the lack of crosstalk between disciplines. And basically, the goal of this workshop, or also the goal of the live session today, is to bring together robotics researchers which are and also which are not uh, familiar with these techniques with the goal of uh, discussing existing solutions, open problems, to come with new questions and to discuss different issues. Um, as another goal, we also want to bring together like a broader audience, so people from, from various disciplines, including, uh, for example, pure machine learning researcher, in order to discuss those applications and um, basically to try to see if we can bridge uh, some of those applications between some fields. So um, this is part of the team of the organizers. Those are the ones that are mostly running the session today. So this is Claire, Christophoros, Leonel, Basileos, Hans-Peter, and myself. And this is the second part of the organizers because we are too many to be in only one slide. So this is Soren, Subrajit, Florian, Siddhartha, and, and Sufrit. Um, so this is the program for today. So the quick introduction, then we're gonna have a Q&A session for um, the first batch of invited talks. Um, after that, we're going to have the spotlight session for um, some of the contributions that were submitted to the workshop, then a panel discussion. Um, then we have a three hour break. Um, so this is for the, the RSS, the main conference, basically. And after the break, we come back. Uh, we have the second Q&A session for the invited talks of the rest of the speakers. Um, then the spotlight session number two with the rest of the contribution, a second panel discussion. And at the end of the day, we have um, the award um, that will be given by BCI and some closing remarks. Um, maybe one note. So th the goal for us today is really that people can discuss together, uh, brainstorm ideas, discuss topics. So just if you want to talk, you have a question, anything, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, you can also write questions in the chat. So yeah, just feel free to participate. Um, so with this, I'm going to give the, the floor to Vasileos to um, start the Q&A session for our first invited speaker. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, so yeah, so the, the first batch of questions, I guess, come uh, for uh, Professor Steve Laval. Uh, it's a great privilege to have him here. Um, uh, he's a professor at the University of Wulu and um, has made a lot of breakthroughs, uh, uh, you know, starting from RTs uh, and then uh, going all the way to, um, I don't know, topological uh, uh, landmark uh, uh, localization with uh, topological landmarks and then um, um, even with virtual reality and all the breakthroughs he did there. Uh, so yeah, so the um, I guess I'm going to start with the first question. I'm going to post it on the chat also. Um, and uh, again, I would like to use this as, uh, as a reference mostly, uh, and uh, we, we we can we can discuss uh, anything that uh, that comes up relatively to to that question. So the question is: Assuming a well-posed research question. Uh, do you have a specific guide in mind for using either uh, stronger weak geometry, topology, set theory, or a combination of them in order to solve it? Uh, so how do we match uh, specific architectures to specific tasks? And uh, Professor Laval, if you're there. Yes, hello, you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here and I appreciate uh, the chance to, um, um, to meet with everyone and, and answer some questions. So, um, you know, as my talk went, I was explaining that, that you could have these sort of different levels of, um, of uh, information in some sense or representations or data structures in the robot's brain and to try to think about how much needs to be there um, um, looking at necessary conditions. And so it, it's hard to sort of make a recipe out of it. I, I would say when you have your well-posed research question or task that task or set of tasks that you want a robot to solve, you have to really think about what could you get away um, with, without measuring, right? Are there parts that, that the robot doesn't have to sense, information that it doesn't need, 
to still be able to accomplish his tasks anyway, in spite of that. And, and, um, and so maybe the recipe or guide in some sense is a path towards minimalism to, to figure out you know, what these basic things are that the robot needs. And if you were to take them away, um, then it wouldn't be able to accomplish its task anymore. Like for example, if it can't distinguish um, a circle from a helix, say a covering space of the circle based on the sensing information that it has, that's a well-known loop closure problem in localization, then um, localization and mapping, th then, um, um, th then some confusion would arise. And so that's the point. It's some kind of topological condition that seems to be needing to be measured and then somehow uh, stored in the robot's brain as it makes decisions. So I hope that gives you some kind of reasonable idea. Yeah, that, that was great. Uh, we get a question in the chat. Uh, the question is, how do you see the current state of the art for the path planning, uh, especially for the industrial robot manipulator applications uh, in regards of real time solutions? Okay, that, that's that's um, not, not so related to my talk, I think, but um, what do I think? Um, I, I thought things are going pretty well, right? I mean, gosh, the, the, the computational devices that we have these days are so much faster than when I was doing RRTs in the late 1990s, for example. And um, it always still boils down to the number of degrees of freedom and um, just how much precision do you need or how low does the dispersion need to get in a sampling-based planning approach to be able to make it through some really narrow corridors and things. If you're in generally fairly open spaces, um, things have, have always been fairly fast in terms of the computation. So you can turn it around the other way and you can always present problems to stump planners in, in the real world. But I would say we're doing pretty well in general. So I, 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 think, um, I think there's real-time performance all over the place and it's being used every day in, in, in industry. Uh, I guess related to that, how do you see the role of feedback, uh, like uh, uh, compared to uh, open loop path planning uh, uh, methods or algorithms? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I've, I've always been um, kind of close to that. And my, my PhD thesis was all uh, feedback motion planning methods using value iteration for things like um, um, optimal non-holonomic systems, stochastic systems and things like that with obstacles and such. And so I've always felt like these things should be very tightly integrated. I think it's all too easy for computer scientists to say, ah, we'll produce the path and we'll leave the low level tracking, uh, uh, um, developing some kind of a tracking control law that's doing feedback um, as kind of a second step. But I really think it's important to consider all of these together. So, uh, but the question is when you consider them together, Maybe you're considering too much by putting too many things into the basket if, if, if the problems are really challenging. So you have to figure out how to maybe slice up or modularize the problem in a different way. And one of the things I think is important that's related to my talk is information feedback. Like you may not have enough information to fully reconstruct the state. In fact, you may never want to have that much information. You can make a much more efficient and robust system by doing inf minimal information feedback and developing your control laws around that. I think we don't do that often enough because a lot of people are coming more from a maybe mechanics and dynamical systems and control background or exclusive or maybe more of a computer science background with algorithms and data structures and these kinds of things. And there's certainly a growing number of people that, 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 that cover both in some ways. And it's exciting to see that. But um, back when I was a, a, a junior researcher, there, there wasn't so much of that. And, and people often didn't know what to do with the results when it's in the middle somewhere. I was very lucky that um, Emilio Frizzoli in, in uh, 1999 showed me one year after I had the RRT, he showed me he used the RRT to do autonomous helicopter flying in, in simulation, but with real time computations because he, he developed, um, uh, he, he found, he calculated optimal cost to goes in the absence of obstacles, um, um, pre-computed those and used that very nicely. So he leveraged his control background and his understanding of that particular dynamical system mixed with, um, you know, quickly, rapidly was, was you know, brilliant guy able to, to learn these motion planning methods and use them right away and implement them all hacked OpenGL on his laptop for an aerospace grad student at that time that was quite unusual around 1999 or 2000. So, so, so I think it, it takes this, unfortunately, you know, having to have these skills and understanding to span these, these what, what are now fairly separate disciplines to really, to really accomplish these things, to kind of break down these barriers and try to consider everything together. It's happening more and more all the time, and I'm excited to see that. Um, Dan Kodachek has been considering feedback together in the motion planning problem for a long time with navigation functions, but I'll, I'll let him have his, he'll say things about that already and he has it installed. Okay, great. Uh, then another question we had is, um, 
uh, it was quite interesting to see that you can achieve uh, optimal results using uh, just topological methods. Uh, do you think there is any way to reconcile the need for optimality with the robustness that topology offers in more general settings? Um, yeah, I mean, I often feel like um, optimality is, is, and I don't claim in those methods that, that they're, they're, they're solving the problems in some sort of globally optimal sense. They're, they're just providing reasonable solutions. And uh, sampling-based motion planning people and motion planning people in general have almost always been more excited about just finding feasible, reasonable solutions. And as you tend towards trying to get optimal solutions, you very often discover that the criterion of optimality is quite faulty. Like it's not really the thing you want to. Like we said, oh, the shortest path, that sounds great. And then it's like, oh, darn it, the shortest path starts to touch obstacles. I meant maximum clearance path. But then you realize, okay, that might not work in some other settings. It might not, and the paths might get too long then. Then you realize maybe Pareto optimal or multi-objective optimization is the right thing to do. So, so I just think it's, it's very important if you want to go down the path of minimalism and, and robustness to not get too obsessed with optimality. And I wouldn't just view the whole world through an optimization lens, like, like, like we're only trying to optimize things. I think it's much more of some kind of incremental sampling and searching through spaces of solutions to arrive at something that's feasible and quite reasonable. And it turns out in these, these planning methods, I mean, sampling-based planning methods will tend not to go around an obstacle 57 times before going to the goal. They, they may not look optimal and you may want to smooth them a bit or do some co-location methods if you have differential constraints to try to improve the solutions and such, but they tend not to do drastically unreasonable things. So, 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 so it's just something to be careful of. It's like a focus on optimality. I, I've loved optimality at different points in my life and done different things with it, but just be careful as you approach your different problems that the price you may pay may be to lose robustness and especially the opportunity to bring the information requirements down much lower to solve your problem. Then you'd have simpler sensors, you're closer to maybe a consumer product or other things like that because you, you, you don't need so much uh, sensing and computation. Okay, great. Uh, then uh, let's see, uh, one more question. Um, so I'm posting it here. Uh, it says your talk covers a wide range of mathematics from point set topology to differentiable manifolds uh, in an excellent way. However, it also highlights the high bar of entrance for a non-expert in these fields. And uh, what is the breakthrough we need so that such abstractions become as widely used as, for example, neural networks, uh, where simple knowledge of Python is enough for a non-expert to build uh, complicated models? Yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a challenging problem, and I've spent my whole life, you know, you know, trying to learn, you know, always learning more and more. And you know, when I, when I was a graduate student in electrical engineering, um, I, I had to learn sort of enough computer science ultimately to be accepted by computer scientists. Spent some time at Stanford Computer Science as a postdoc, and eventually got tenured in computer science because roboticists tend not to have a natural home in most places, right? Most universities, there's not giant um, robotics departments that have been around since the 19th century or something, right? It, it's, it's not like that. And so it ends up being sort of very difficult to span these kinds of things. I think there's no way, easy way out of it, but the, the thing that, 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 um, that, that I really worry about is that very often people in other fields will just view robotics as their application. Machine learning person might say, oh, that's my application field. Before that, it was pure computer science algorithms. People saying, that's an application of algorithms. That's an application of AI. That's an application of nonlinear control systems, right? And, and I think that's the danger. I think robotics has many beautiful, unique questions and they're gonna remain interdisciplinary and, and seeming to require kind of a big span of studying until it becomes more of, I would say, a well-established discipline with its own kind of core problems, not someone else's application, but rather really deep, fundamental and interesting questions. And I feel like we're still largely in that kind of stage. And in order to make progress, unfortunately, you do seem to have to know a lot about mathematics because robotics, I think, fundamentally struggles at the mathematical modeling stage. Like what's really the right, right way to sort of describe the problem, either on paper, or in the machine as a data structure that's representing what the, what the robot needs to keep in its brain as it, as it tries to um, make decisions, choose commands, execute and, and, and um, generate motions and things of that nature. So- I'm applauding you wildly, Professor Laval. I'm sorry? I'm applauding you wildly as you speak these words, Professor Laval. Oh, that sounds like Dan. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, okay, uh, then. I think the last question I have on my list is this one. And um, it says, could you elaborate more on the forgetful uh, um, category theory factors that you mentioned? Uh, what would be a good equivalent example for robotics? 
Oh yeah, th yeah. Thanks very much. I guess what, what what I'm trying to say there. I, oh, first of all, just a little story. You know, when I was in graduate school, one of the last courses I took was algebraic topology. It was a thorough kind of thrashing. You know, it was around 1992 or so. You didn't have roboticists talking about algebraic topology and homology on, and singular complexes and all of these kinds of things. Um, but 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 um, uh, but but I remember learning about the forgetful functor, and it just seemed like the most ridiculous term. And kind of like, what are these crazy mathematicians doing, right? Why would you want to just throw stuff away? And I just wanted to point out that. That's one of the most important things to be able to do in the robot brain or in any kind of sensing. You want to throw information away. You want to forget things um, as early as possible if they're irrelevant to your task. If you look at the human eye, this is not quite forgetful functor, but it reminds me of the same thing. You have a bunch of information landing on the retina, a bunch of what, what could be seen as data, but then the ganglion cells do some, some and, and other, other cell structures. Um, well, they should be behind the retina, but they're kind of in front because of some weird inversion but but um, anyway they do some kind of processing they destroy much of the information they do some kind of what we might call basic feature detection or like low level computer vision looking kind of processing before it goes to the optic nerve so so the human body is very good at at forgetting things that ends up being irrelevant in the later stages and i, and I just think that's an important thing so I, I i when i look at the different areas of mathematics i like to think that um, each one has its favorite uh, equivalence relation when are two things considered to be identical and, and in order to make things be identical, you need to forget more and more, right? To, to get to get more and more levels of abstraction. You know, a donut and a coffee cup are equal through homeomorphism. That's that's quite a level of uh, equality. Or two sets are equal just because there exists a bijection between them. Wow, that's that's you know re really getting getting pretty abstract. So, but you might it may be very valuable to do that. You do that through the process of forgetting. You know, so so you may sense and measure a bunch of things. I may make an abstract sensor, a kind of virtual sensor. It looks like it could obtain depth information, but I'll forget the depth information and I'll only keep track of discontinuities in depth because that's something topological. And in one of our works, this gap navigation tree work we did, that ends up strangely letting you do distance optimal navigation in terms of Euclidean distance, but yet it's only doing, it's only tracking these topological changes and it forgets everything else. So then it becomes robust with respect to the things that have been forgotten. Okay, great. Uh, I think that's. These are all the questions I had, uh, and uh, if you can move to the next speaker, let me. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So now it's uh, it's my turn to to share this uh, Q and A for the second talk, which was uh, given by by Slava Burovsky and Alexander Terin. So both are PhD students currently. I think Alexander is about to, 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 to graduate and to finish his PhD. And uh, their talk was actually about Gaussian process on Riemannian manifolds for robotics. So it actually addressed uh, from a machine learning perspective, um, the problem of uh, um, having a parameter space that actually relies on, on Riemannian manifolds. And, uh, and actually Alexander and Anuslava have done uh, an amazing job recently uh, in several papers that address this problem, and um, I think we have both of them currently in, in in the in the meeting, right? Yes. Hello, I am here. Okay. Cool. So um, um, I do have some. I'm some here questions. as well, but I'm not sure that my internet connection is stable enough. So uh, I will just try to answer maybe some questions, and if it doesn't work, I will let Alex handle everything. Okay, okay, then it's good that we have both of you at the same time. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, thank you guys uh, for, for the talk and for, for being here. Um, so one of the, of the questions that I actually got uh, for, for the talk that I will just uh, share in the chat is um, why the correct definition of, of matron kernels on Riemannian manifold does not require the manifold to be isometric to an Euclidean space as opposed to the naive generalization. Sorry, the sound cut out. Can you please repeat the question? Um, so the question is why the correct definition of modern kennels on Riemannian manifolds does not require the manifold to be isometric to an Euclidean space, as opposed to the naive uh, generalization. So let me try to uh, sort of interpret this right. Um, the question is, ask, is essentially asking, um, well, so the let me kind of try 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 to rephrase this. The um, what happens in this case is that a priori, if you just define a matern kernel, 
then whether or not this is a kernel in kind of a valid mathematical sense depends on the uh, domain that is used for uh, that definition. In particular, the kernel, the matern kernel, as we classically think about it, is something that is only defined if the space is Euclidean. And, in, and you can see this directly from the formula because it requires you to take a uh, subtract one element of the space from another one and calculate Euclidean norms. So a priori, when we sort of start the work that we do, that's the only thing we have. Now, the question that you might ask is, OK, but the actual concept of a kernel, that's a concept that ought to make sense in some way when we change the space and make it into a manifold. And so um, then the question becomes, OK, if we want to change the space and make it into a manifold, then how do we correctly adapt the notion of a kernel in order to basically get a Gaussian process that mathematically is well defined and exists? And then, um, so this is kind of the way I would think about this rather than kind of asking why, wh why the thing has to be isometric. Um, where that comes in is if you, def if you try to define a kernel by taking the squared exponential limiting case, which has sort of fewer parameters, maybe a little bit simpler, you want to start with that one. And if you take that case and you ask yourself, OK, I want to have this work on a manifold. How do I do it? Well, the first thing I might try to do is replace the Euclidean norm with a geodesic distance, because that sort of is the reasonable analog of a distance on a manifold. Um, you know, Instead of Euclidean distances, we talk about shortest path distances. And uh, then um, I don't recall the details immediately of how this is actually proven, maybe Slava might, um, but this was shown by Faragin that it basically just doesn't work. Um, it's, it's not mathematically the, the right thing to do because you can change the length scale to make this thing not positive semi-definite and therefore not a valid Gaussian process. So that's kind of the backdrop of, around our work. Um, and we sort of start with this and we say, well, if that doesn't make, if it, if it turns out that this idea through geodesics doesn't actually make sense, well, then what does make sense? Well, and, and sort of we begin by thinking about these kernels in a different way. And that's kind of some of what you've seen presented by the talk. Uh, I do want to know, note that the notion uh, of these kernels through stochastic partial differential equations is not originally due to us. It's sort of discovered 60 years ago uh, by Peter Whittle, uh, and then popularized in the statistics community also about 10 years ago. So really all that we're doing is sort of developing the right technical tools for, for working with these sorts of things. Um, but that's kind of a bit of the backdrop and overview of the, of the contribution. Does, did that answer the question? Um, I think so. Um, it's a little bit lengthy, a... <laughs> but, I, but the question was asked in such a way that I have to kind of explain a little bit of uh, what the thinking is. The, the Maybe I can add, the, add a little comment that, uh, so um, it, all comes, it all comes down to what's the right notion for these kind of kernels that we are very used to in Euclidean case. And uh, um, this uh, SPD, SPDE notion turns out to be much more natural than the distance-based notion. For instance, we are all very used to matern kernels being uh, uh, Markovian in one dimension or something like Markovian uh, in higher dimensions. And this is something that cannot be, uh, that's not really naturally connected to the uh, distance um, stuff. It's something that very naturally though uh, uh, inherited from the uh, SPDE definition. Uh, so this is all comes down to what to the, the definition we actually use is the one which may be more uh, simple in Euclidean case, but it not not the right one conceptually to generalize. And this is why it works in the in the Riemannian case if we actually take the right definition.
All right. Okay, so that, that, that's actually a very nice clarification as well. Um, I just want to ask the audience, um, in case do you have any question, I still encourage you to um, unmute and to 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 ask, he, or to actually also write down the, the question in the, the chat. Um, out of the of some of the questions that we got offline, uh, I do have uh, another one in case that nobody from the audience wants to ask something. And please do not be intimidated. I'm at least I'm very interested in kind of talking about this work to people, which is not as scary as it might look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe just to to keep the discussion on. So there is another uh, question here in the chat. So it says uh, during the during your talk, you briefly mentioned the problem of dynamics model learning with the uh, Gaussian process. So have you explored, investigated the Gaussian process that feed dynamics of systems on Riemannian manifolds? Uh, sorry, can you repeat this again? Have we explored what? Uh, Gaussian process that fit dynamics of systems on Riemannian manifolds. That fit dynamics of systems. Yes, I guess that the, the question um, refers to, to systems that mm -hmm. evolve on a Riemannian manifold, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have, a little bit um, in, uh, this is um, one of the uh, examples that was shown in the paper. And actually I have, I have kind of two, two, two things I want to mention off of that. Um, the first is that we have the example of the uh, pendulum dynamics in the paper, which sort of is an extremely simple system, I guess, compared to often what people would, in robotics would want to work with, but is already interesting if you want to do it with uncertainty involved. Uh, and in that example, um, things more or less work out. Um, and one of the reasons that they do is that all we're doing is uh, probabilistic uncertainty aware interpolation of dynamics. Uh, within the paper, there is no decision making layer, such as, for instance, model based reinforcement learning built on top of that. Now, what we've done is we've got another bit of work uh, that was uh, recently uh, published at JMLR on pathwise conditioning methods for Gaussian processes. And in that work, um, the one of the examples that we explore is uh, model-based reinforcement learning using a uh, PILCO method. Um, now PILCO, um, if I recall, stands for uh, probabilistic inference for learning control. So this is essentially a model-based reinforcement learning method where the model is defined by the Gaussian process and uh, there is a uh, expected policy gradient type kind of planning scheme that's built on top of this. And this is used uh, for, uh, in the original work for solving things like cart poles from uh, observed dynamics uh, in like a very small amount of episodes. So it's designed to be really a data efficient method. And the problem with it is scalability. Uh, oftentimes, it's just very hard to get the Gaussian process model to work in that kind of thing. So we've explored um, a little bit these models in those settings. And one of the things that at least I've found um, is that there are many difficulties that come up that are not so much Gaussian process theoretic in nature, but much more on the uh, planning and control side of the problem. For instance, you get a uh, behavior where the Gaussian process sort of learns the data correctly. It gives you your error bars and all looks good. And then the system has like a lot of problems like finding actually a reasonable policy. And so you have to, you have to spend a lot of time tweaking and tuning and, and doing this kind of thing. Um, in order to try to get the example to work. And this is all in like, like relatively small um, synthetic kind of cart pole type settings that we've looked at this in. So, th so there, I think there's sort of um, the challenges that we presented in, in the talk are, are sort of one aspect of the challenges, actually very promising for things like Bayesian optimization. But if you want to actually get data efficient model-based reinforcement learning to work, there are many questions that one needs to consider that go beyond just good model building. And I have just, the um, aspects. 
I have just a pretty short uh, follow-up comment on that. So uh, now that you bring up this problem of, of, of learning and fitting the uh, dynamics and all the uncertainty on remaining manifolds, so I mean, kind of one of the classical uh, uh, problems in robotics and actually in reinforcement learning is that if I have a robot in effect or uh, whose state is described in SCA3, um, then if you collect data from it and you actually want to, 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 to learn a Gaussian process in it. So I'm wondering like, uh, um, are there out there like Gaussian process that properly encode uncertainty of these dynamics on, on these kind of manifolds? Because the usual thing that you see in robotics is that they use a vanilla or multi-output Gaussian process there but they don't respect the geometry of the space. So I'm just uh, wondering if uh, we You're have the right to do that. asking where the output space rather than yes. the input space has the a output. geometric structure. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this one, this is a good question and it's one that is tricky. Um, and the reason that it's tricky- I think, is because... uh, I think there should be some uh, very much related reference to this uh, in the introduction of uh, our paper on the Gaussian processes with inputs on- uh, Let me just uh, also uh, say again that uh, the audience feel free to post or unmute yourselves to ask a question. I have more questions and uh, I can keep going, but uh, it would There's be nice if we- chat. All right. Uh, let's read that question. Ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, is the do you want to say it yourself, or I can also read it? Uh, um, yeah, I can ask it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. So my question was, so I, I do I do find kind of some similarities, but I'm not. It's like yes, I have an intuitive similarity, but I'm not sure if actually there is any similarity between them. But I, I do feel that there is some kind of similarity between the concept itself of the fiber bundle that I was not so familiar until I, I read your paper and the null space itself that is why we apply it in, in robot control. Because at the end in the null space, you have this idea of, okay, I have like the, the base space that will be maybe the SE3, but all the rest, like all these extra dimensions that I'm not taking care of where, that are representing some, uh, the, uh, the fiber itself is this one. I don't know if you, if you have some. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so actually, if we have different levels of abstractions, um, then between each of those levels, we have projections onto the next abstraction level. And each of those projections has, of course, also a null space. And the null space can like have different forms, of course. Um, but the main benefit of actually using fiber bundles and not talking about um, null spaces is actually the, the additional vocabulary. So if you actually read a mathematical text on fiber bundles, you quickly see that uh, even in the beginning, they introduce notions like path sections and path restrictions. And those are really things which you need to actually develop algorithms which are super efficient to plan over different abstractions levels. And you could have the same with, with null spaces, of course. You could also say, okay, there's the path restriction and the path section. Um, but yeah, um, with fiber bundles, people have made this very explicit and uh, it's a very good way to actually think about it. And also it helps you to structure the code which you write. And yeah, this is basically the main motivation for us to, to introduce fiber bundles because they have like this additional vocabulary. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, hope to hear more in the panel session later. Okay, so our next speaker was um, Georgios Arvanitidis. I think Georgios, you're here. Yes, I am. Nice. Um, so Georgios is a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent System um, here in Germany. And his talk was about uh, Riemann manifolds learned from data where um, basically he learns visual Latin space that is uh, intelligent, intelligently learned um, with respect to the geometry of the M in space. Um, so again, if anybody in the audience has questions, just feel free to post it in the chat or just uh, speak up. And in the meantime, I will post the, the first question that, that we got, which is um, when learning the Brownian based prior um, based on the learned geometry by the variational autoencoder, you seem to use the metric of the VAE decoder. 
Um, how does the training process work in this case? Do you first learn the VAE and then the prior, or do you learn both at the same time? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation and uh, the nice introduction. I think I have to change my photo, by the way. Uh, it's quite old. Uh, so the, the idea is the following. Uh, in the beginning, we, uh, we start training the VAE. And uh, after some steps, uh, we start using the, the learned model uh, for the prior. So I would say uh, that uh, when we when we do the, the random walk, we keep fixed what we have learned in the previous uh, loop of the training process. We do the brown and motion, and then we update the parameters. So uh, you can think about it about it as an EM algorithm, wherein the expectation yeah expectation step you keep the you train the the VA. And in the maximization step, you use the what you have learned to for the prior to do the sampling. So is it yeah? Of course, it's hard to train both at the same time because this is going to be super degenerate. In practice, what we do, we train for a few steps the VAE, so it has learned already something, and then we start using that to to sample from the prior. That's the high level idea. Okay, thank you very much. Is it is it clear or? I, mean, I, I think it was, the, it was clear, yes. Um, okay. At least for me, I think that was fine. Have a sorry. Have a short question, George, uh, on on this topic. Yeah. Um, so when you when you want to to learn the, the prior uh, based on this brown motion, so uh, I, I guess that the, the dimensionality of the Latin space influences a lot on on how well you can actually learn this prior, right? Um, so. Did you find some difficulties there, like uh, in terms of the convergence of, of the training for the Bronio motion? True. I mean, that, that's true fact, because in case you have higher dimensionalities for the latent space and your metrics are a bit degenerate, for instance, then uh, of course you will have even uh, convergence problems and whatever. The truth is that in the experiments, as far as I remember, we didn't try very high dimensionalities like 100, for instance. Uh, I think two, three, five. Also, I wasn't the one who ran the full experiments. I cannot answer the in full details. Uh, but also the second truth is that we don't really learn uh, many things for the prior. Basically, the prior is learned automatically by the model. It's only, uh, you can think about that as a, a heat kernel that we had before the people talking about the, the kernels and manifolds. Basically, you have a heat kernel over a minor manifold and then what you do is you need just a sample from this uh, distribution. So eventually what you end up doing is you use the metric you have learned and you, you know, you sample for one second, for instance, uh, multiple burn motion steps, then you can back propagate from that. So the high level intuition that I, with this prior that I get is that uh, you allow your sample points to stay within the support of your metric somehow. Maybe this work can be further improved because this was the first version. So I'm pretty sure uh, improvements can be done. But the high level idea is that you don't need to learn something. Okay, except maybe okay. The, the mean value of this uh, brown and motion start or the, the time that you have to diffuse. But at the high level, you don't need to learn anything. You have to respect the metric. And then yes, for your answer, how well the metric behaves depending on the dimensionality of the latent space is a different story. If, the, if it doesn't behave well, or it might be that the, the latent space is so big, so you end up having again a Gaussian more or less, if your metric doesn't learn a lot of structure in the latent space. Okay, okay, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. So um, we have another question that was asked offline. Um, I will post it in the chat. So the question was, may you please elaborate on why the RBF network and encoding the uncertainty are not robust when learning the Riemannian metric? So this was mentioned in the context of approximating the Riemannian metric in the last part of the talk. Okay, so the idea here is the following. Uh, in the past, when we tried to start uh, proposing these uh, Riemannian metrics in the latent space, one problem was that, uh, you know, there were some other people uh, working on the same problem, but they used the deterministic generators to learn the metric in the latent space. The problem with that approach is that whenever in the place where you don't have data in the ambient space and in the corresponding place in the latent space, you don't know how your deterministic function will behave. 
So eventually the metric in that part of the latent space is, I wouldn't say wrong, but it's arbitrary. You don't know how it behaves. Uh, so we had to come up with a solution to increase the uncertainty of the decoding uh, step or the, the, generate, the generating step from the latent space to the ambient space and to have a meaningful uncertainty quantification. And we did this trick with RBF. So we had, we fit the precision instead of the variance with an RBF uh, network. And then to calculate the uncertainty, we just invert this, which means that the uncertainty explodes whenever you don't have latent codes in the latent space. The problem with this approach is that the RBF or the kernels, uh, they don't behave very well in the following sense. When you move in the boundaries of their support, suddenly the, uh, the, the gradients that you actually use, the Jacobian, explodes. Uh, and this happens, this might happen in the following sense that you have some latent codes, you fit, you have a center of the RBF, you have the support, there are a few points on the tails of this uh, RBF kernel. So in this particular point, uh, the metric will explode. Uh, that's one problem. Uh, of course, it's a meaningful behavior to some extent, but it's not very helpful in practice because then uh, all the solvers that we use, uh, the, or even the geodesic distances will be overestimated. So that's one problem. And the second problem is that to do this metric learning by using the VAE generator, you need the Jacobians, both from the mean function, both from the uncertainty there. And that's of course, you know, costly operators. And especially depending on, 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 the, on the actual data set that you have and the actual problem that you solve, they might be very degenerate. For instance, they, you know, the uncertainty can have very, if you fit a very, an RBF with a lot of kernels, it might be that you have a lot of bumps and in between of all these bumps, you, the gradients explode and you know, the numerics will not behave well. So the, the solution or this approximate metric I proposed is instead of learning only the generator, learn a prior and then use the inverse of the prior as a conformal metric that approximates the, the true metric. Of course, this is very, you know, mathematically it's hard to argue why this approximate metric and the pullback metric we had before they're equivalent, but at least you can argue that topologically, this approximate metric uh, agrees a lot with RBF, uh, you know, the behavior of the RBF because it's only small near your latent codes. And as you move away, it explodes. The second benefit is that, except of this uh, topological, uh, you know, similarities that you have, is that it's very robust because you have a very simple function to learn if you learn the prior, you know, with the method I, I saw, you have very simple functions that you need the derivatives of them. It's very smooth. So to, to, find, to finish my, my answer, like beforehand, the RBF, even if it's a simple trick and it seems to work, in practice, it has some problems, especially at the points that they fall near the boundaries of the RBF kernels where the gradients explode. And this new metric is much more smooth and much, uh, it's a conformal metric, much easier to, to, to use in the differential equations of the shortest paths. So yeah, that's why, why we believe it's more uh, robust in the sense that you don't overestimate the, the geodesics, especially when the points fall near the, the boundaries of the RBF kernels. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the very nice answer, very complete. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions for Georges? Um, otherwise, that was all the ones that I had. So we can we can go on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Georges. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. So our next invited speaker is Philip Maric from the universities of Toronto and Zagreb. Uh, I learned about uh, Philip at the occasion of a similar workshop last year where he actually uh, gave a contributed presentation and uh, won the best, best paper award. And so he was promoted to become invited speaker for this workshop and I'm very happy about this. Um, again, I would like to urge and encourage questions from the audience. So if you have questions, just unmute your microphone and ask them or write them in the chat or just write a question in the chat and then I will, will uh, give word to you. Okay. 
thank you very much. So first of all, yes, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to speak at this workshop. And I'd just like to mention very briefly that uh, the contribution that we got the best paper award uh, for was uh, work that I did jointly with my colleague, uh, Matthew, Gia uh, Matthew Giamu. So yeah, just wanted to uh, mention that. Okay. Yes, that's nice and fair. I don't see any questions in the chat. So let me start by asking uh, a question by myself. In your, in your presentation, you uh, presented a distance function for ellipsoids, which is actually quite remarkable mm -hmm. because it has a lot of invariance properties. Uh, but what I fail is having an intuition of how the distance between ellipsoids would look like. Maybe you could elaborate a bit on this. How could you could you sort of, of improve my, my intuitive understanding of such a distance? Maybe at hand of very simple examples. Right, okay. So we know that uh, the, the, so matrices, uh, so positive definite symmetric matrices actually describe ellipsoids and we know that these matrices are in fact in fact do not constitute a vector space and the uh, and you can kind of imagine that within the vector space of symmetric matrices uh, i believe that uh, positive definite symmetric matrices form kind of a convex cone and so kind of uh, the distance between uh, between two points uh, on that cone would need to would need to be the distance of of kind of a curve that that remains uh, on the cone itself so within the cone more specifically so 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 um, i guess that would be kind of a like a graphical representation of of this this distance that i think is also uh, I think it's shown pretty often in a lot of papers that uh, that kind of deal with these uh, distances uh, based on ellipsoids. But uh, what would be, for example, the distance between the unit sphere? I mean, uh, because of this, this geometric invariance, I assume it's a, it's a distance which sort of uh, disregards orientation, right? Right. So, so in our work, uh, what we do, and and this is. Um, I guess uh, maybe I should I should just uh, mention a bit of the background here. Um, you can basically uh, talk about the uh, numerical conditioning of the manipulator Jacobian, so the the quality of the mapping between joint movements and the end effector movements of the robot by kind of reasoning about something called the manipulability ellipsoid, and. So the the idea here is like previous approaches attempt to somehow inflate this ellipsoid or avoid uh, avoid this ellipsoid degrading in some dimension. So you can imagine this ellipsoid having six axes, which represent the directions in which the robot can move in the in the task space. So what you what 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 generally uh, what we generally try to avoid is one of these axes, which are a function of the joint configuration, uh, deterior deteriorating to a zero length. So uh, to to kind of achieve that, there, there have been a lot of uh, various kind of indices developed, which you can then optimize in order to, uh, that can be interpreted geometrically as kind of either the inflating the ellipsoid or, or keeping the ellipsoids uh, the ellipsoid's axis lengths uh, kind of uh, similar. Um, and so to that end, we introduced um, this distance. Uh, we, we asked the question, okay, so you can, you can kind of, you, you have a bunch of these indices that you can interpret geometrically uh, as this ellipsoid. So could we perhaps uh, develop a, an index that you can essentially look at as reducing the distance between your current manipulability ellipsoid and some manipulability ellipsoid that you would like to have, that you would ideally like to have. And kind of uh, an important uh, property here was your, your, your choice of ellipsoid. And 
the ellipsoid we actually chose was a sphere because it turns out that the Riemannian distance between uh, any ellipsoid and a sphere that envelops it is, is of course, uh, invariant to the rotation of your ellipsoid. And this is kind of important because if you're trying to just avoid your ellipsoid uh, degenerating in some direction, like one of the axes degenerating, uh, what you're actually, you, you don't really care about the orientation of the ellipsoid itself. You just want to extend it in every possible direction. And this is why kind of we chose this distance, uh, this Riemannian distance between a sphere and an ellipsoid. Um, and this is where the kind of rotation invariance property comes in. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the audience? Yeah, I don't see any. I'll wait a little longer. Okay, uh, looking at uh, at the clock and at our, our schedule, we are quite a bit behind the schedule. So, um, Philip, if you don't don't mind too much, then I would suggest we pass on to the next invited okay. speaker. But thank you very much for your answers. I'm, I'm uh, very you. curious about learning more about these distances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It is my great honor to introduce Professor Daniel Koditsek from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Professor Koditsek has done some um, remarkable and really impactful work in robotics spanning many areas, but maybe you've heard of navigation functions uh, and then all the way through contributions with legend robotics um, and uh, also the semantic work that um, Vasilis has done recently. Um, and uh, the, I, I thought that the talk gives a very nice overview and connection of spanning three, four decades of work. Uh, so thank you for this talk. Um, one of the things that caught my attention in this talk was uh, this analogy that you drew between uh, topology and logic, uh, and basically arguing that topology is to robotics what logic is to computing. Um, and I thought that this is a very powerful analogy. And uh, could you perhaps uh, elaborate on this? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, organizers uh, for this, uh, for, of course, for the invitation, but also the, uh, it's just a lovely session, lovely set of talks. It's so exciting for me to see, um, oh, some wonderful old familiar faces, but also this, the great number of young people who are um, doing serious work. It's, I, can I use the word thrilling to see this? I, sometimes I begin to lose some faith in the field. Anyway, so I, I'm very, very grateful for the invitation and uh, I want to congratulate you guys, the organizers, for putting together such a nice, uh, each one of these talks, I haven't seen them all, each one of these talks is is, is quite interesting and, and gives me great, um, anyway, uh, the, um, if you buy, you know, going back to what uh, Steve Laval said, if, if you buy my notion that robotics is the, wants to be, wants to become the science of programming work, you're stuck with basins for mathematical reasons, and you can embrace basins because they solve the signal to symbol problem if you use topology to work with them and organize their adjacency relations. And so that the, the, the analogy begins with the need to bridge the signal to symbol divide, in other words, to ground. We, we need abstractions, and if we're going to be doing any kind of programming at all, we need symbols. You can't program in signal spaces. You can only print program with symbols, and the difficulty has always been uh, that uh, there's a gulf between symbols as used in computer science and signals as required for estimation theory, control theory, those kind of things that you need at the hardware level. And so that what I what I tried to do in this uh, annual reviews paper, uh, which I'm advertising in my talk, is I try to work through with some care the way in which one uses. So, so what you get from topology is you get simultaneously um, a, 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 the emergence, the formal grounding of symbols in the signal spaces and the 
uh, sensory motor spaces on the one hand. On the other hand, you get an intrinsic notion of uncertainty that's a little bit less familiar to people, uh, chain recurrent um, sets, epsilon keychains, things like that. Um, so you get an intrinsically uh, defined noise resistant that is robust um, methods of putting things together. So I, I can find echoes of all of these ideas in many of the talks. I, I, I would say of, of the other talks that I saw, probably the ones that are most directly close to what I'm describing is uh, Professor is Dr. Orte's talk, uh, where um, we you know, the the template anchor relation. If you have enough control of what the template anchor relation imposes uh, of um, a fiber bundle and um, the work that he's doing is very exciting because a lot of the difficulty is relating the obstacles in the fiber. The, 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 the base space typically won't know anything about certain kinds of obstacles. It doesn't have high enough dimension. And so what Orte apparently has been able to do, I'll have to read his papers more carefully, is um, find a way to project um, the, the obstacles in the fiber down into the uh, base space so that one can reason about them or hallucinated versions of them base space so that's very uh, another connection I would say is the um, you, you know the, there's a talk by uh, Alin uh, Abu Schaefer very interesting a lot of what we're doing in the base space is using geodesics but um, we're trying we we can't use geodesics in the fiber because the fiber wants to wants to converge down to the base uh, space where there will be geodesics, uh, and these want to be hierarchical relations. Anyway, I'm going on, and I'm sorry. Every, everywhere you turn, if you if you believe as I do that one of the first problems, if not the first problem of robotics, is programming work, is you you can't escape the need to bridge signals and symbols and uh, program with them, and that's what topology does for us automatically. That's what it was invented to do. Thank you, and just to keep the flow with that. Uh, one other thing you said in that uh, paper that you that you mentioned uh, in, in your talk as well um, is that robotics is a synthetic science, right? And um, it's an emerging science that I don't think we have yet uh, formalized to the extent that we would have hoped for. So we are in 2021. There's a lot of advances over several decades of work. But we're still not there at the very concrete, uh, uh, I don't know, formalization. And part of the problem is we don't have robotics departments, uh, as you also mentioned, which is probably something, I think it's something that uh, Professor Laval also hinted at. So I was wondering if you could make a short comment on that. Oh boy, I was uh, <laughs> jumping up and down when Steve uh, said that. I think it's so problematic for the field. Most most people don't even believe there is a field. Most people believe that robotics is just some strange technological meeting ground where, you know, engineers collaborate with computer scientists and, uh, you know, they have fun and they build gadgets. Uh, it's it's truly, truly, truly impeded uh, progress. Uh, um, and uh, w w one, the, the, the way in which intellectual progress is made at least in the 20th and 21st centuries is through academic departments, as I've tried to argue in this paper. We don't have that. And so as Steve was hinting, um, the field gets poached upon by well-meaning people who are using it as application ground, you know, sort of a, a shooting gallery, you know, fish in a barrel. You can shoot the fish in the barrel of robotics uh, from, you know, your uh, math view or your computer science view or your electrical engineering view. Uh, and unfortunately that's, that's impeded progress a great deal. Um, again, I just want to say how excited I am to see that there's a group of young people now um, represented, for example, in this excellent uh, group set uh, that's trying not to <laughs> apply tools, but trying to define a field using tools. That's what I see in a lot of these talks. So it's very, very exciting for me to see this. Great, thanks so much. Uh, maybe time for one question from the audience as well. Yeah, I have one, um, if that's uh, okay. Sure. Um, so my question actually has to do with the previous remarks you've had. Um, I am um, not a roboticist. I am a machine learning theory and methods guy um, 
who <laughs> has done the exact thing you say to some degree, which is uh, tried to look to, at the field of robotics for like inspiration for how some of the ideas that I study could be put to practical use. And so my question to you then is um, in the future, because for me, my career path is academia, what can I do to support other people who are roboticists who are interested in in the long run kind of self-organizing to actually build the field. I mean, I'm going to be a postdoc, so it's a while before I can, I think, really do much to this regard, but I would love to help once I can. Well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to imply that we don't want visitors from uh, other areas, but what we want to do is seduce those visitors. And in your, in your case, I wasn't able to, to spend a lot of time on the talk, which I found very, very interesting. Roughly speaking, you know, I, I think, um, if you guys embrace, it, it, I, a suggestion would be, if you, if you look at uh, Alin's talk, al Buschefer's in the next session, he's using um, these uh, essentially uh, Riemannian metrics that come from the inertia tensor of the, of the hardware to try to find geodesics. And I know that you guys are not looking for geodesics. Geodesics do figure prominently in the kinds of clouds that you're going to be inventing or discovering. Uh, if we could get, if we could get the um, estimation side, which I'm going to lump you into, to connect up to the action side, which I'm going to lump Alan into, um, through these uh, connections, I, I mean the connection in a quasi-formal sense, in other words, you, you've got geodesics that will emerge from the data sets that you're collecting. Those geodesics are necessarily very, very different than the ones that the hardware wants. It's a fascinating question to ask, what's the right way to, to combine the geodesic, the, the short distances and the, and, the, and the directions coming out of the data, the learning data or the, the estimation side with uh, the very, very different shaped Riemannian metrics that we get from the inertia tensors and the hardware of the action side on the, on the doing of the physical work side. Um, these eventually will become topological problems, but we don't know how to pose them topologically until you guys who are experts on the geometry talk to each other and, and, uh, and, and, and have this dialogue about how, how do you reconcile these very, very, very different metrics, which, which, will, which will need to be reconciled in order to do good. Uh, eventually, we want to do online things, as, as Laval again was saying, uh, that we, we, we'd like to be doing our, our planning uh, with infinitesimal generators eventually, even though we don't have to start there. I don't know if that made any sense to you. Yeah, that would be so then, so, so the big theme I get kind of pulling a little bit like out of the details into the bigger picture would be to take the time and communicate with people doing both model learning sort of things, sort of more like the side that, we, that we've done work on, as well as people doing like actual planning, action selection control, this right. kind of thing. And so your advice would be then to actually communicate with people yeah. kind of at every and, level and of what kind of problem. In, in, indeed, and particularly for example, as an example that look at this talk by Anchi Lee, wonderful talk by Anchi Lee, who's doing exactly that. She's, she's trying to pull back um, uh, um, metric properties, distance-like properties from the workspace into the configuration space of the joints whilst battling the punctures in the joint space itself. And she's trying to build learning systems that respect both of them. You know, there are many, many problems that, that she'll face. Uh, there will be local, the infinitesimal generators are gonna have all sorts of local problems that, you know, there'll be local mins, uh, the spaces in general will become disconnected. We don't know how to check them, but that hurt, I think her talk is, is a very interesting mix of these two sides of the, uh, you, you know, what, what, what distances are like when you're trying to sense things. Uh, versus what distances are like when trying to move things. Again, I'll refer to Steve's work. Steve has done a lot of work on trying to keep track of what information, what's the minimal information you need um, to do that in the continuum rather than in the discretization of the spaces is kind of the thing that you guys know how to do in, in ways that I don't think we've known how to do before. I certainly know how to do it before. Great, thanks so much. Uh, let's pause here and uh, because we have to put the spotlight talks next. Um, Noemi, um, take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let me share it in the screen. I hope this time 
and nothing is going to crash. Sorry for the last one. Um, so here we are. Um, so, okay, I'm going to go with this three uh, third spotlight and then um, um, I don't remember if it's Leonel or Vasilos is going to take over to collect the question that you have on those uh, three first talks. We're not hearing any sound. When you share, did you uh, click uh, share? No, yeah. I'm going to again. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, hello everyone. No. Uh, my name is Andreas Otter. It is my pleasure to introduce our workshop paper, uh, Approximate Topological Optimization. The sound is not uh, for robot motion plot. Great. Sorry? The sound is quite garbled. Um, okay, that I cannot do anything better, I think. Does one of you guys want to try? I yeah, think you have I'll... to put it on 100%. I think you put it like on more. Than 100. Let me know if he's better. And this is John Brock with Florian Pocani. And mm, no. And this paper is called Multimodal. One second. I'll try pulling up the talks on Drive really quickly and see if it all, if I can share it. Okay, let's try. I'm not sure if it's the sound of the video or if it's my computer again. The sound was so bad, it, it cannot be the sound of the original video, I guess. Okay, so it's probably my computer then. Very sorry for that. So it, I think it, it uh, pays off to take some time to fix things now and uh, have a, a decent sound quality, even if, if uh, we're sort of running out of time, but uh, we'll just try to get things done properly. I think that's more important. Definitely. Yeah, I hope it's not my video. <laughs> I mean, I, you would I have hear, noticed. I hear the sound yeah, fight. So. <laughs> so the the idea is that uh, we will be streaming a bunch of uh, shorter videos and then collect questions to all three videos. So during the videos, you can already write to the chat or uh, prepare your questions, and then there will be some time to ask questions and uh, hopefully also to answer them. That's the basic idea, while we are still preparing to properly stream the videos. Claire is very busy, it seems. Uh, actually, let me try this again. I think I have to do the thing. Um, share screen. Hello, my name is Andreas Ortai. Okay, the sound works. <laughs> <laughs> sound was getting there. Sorry about that. One. Yeah, the sounds better. <laughs> um, share computer sound. There we go. Off my screen sharing for video. Zoom. Got it. Yes, yeah, hello everyone. Um, uh, my, my name is Andreas Ortai. It is my pleasure to introduce our workshop paper, uh, Approximate Topological Optimization Using Multimodal Estimation for Robot Motion Planning. Uh, this is John Burgos, Florian Pocorni, and Mark Husson. And this paper is called Multimodal Optimization, which is a problem of finding all modes with half optimization problem. We define the mode as half invariant under optimization cost functional. And you might already know a single mode optimization where we try to find a single path, path which cannot, cannot be proved one by a path, path or trajectory optimizer. And what our work will be called those path and trajectory, and trajectory optimization methods, methods but, but leverages them um, to enumerate modes and, and provide as end supporting questions guarantees. And this is new code in Bacroft, we can use it to give global convergence guarantees to existing optimization algorithms and to have contingencies with planning or backup plans. 
And in this paper, um, our conclusions are written about the temptation algorithm, which actually has the conversion guarantees, and it provides the proof that all modes of a certain size are found in the limit. And our work extends a bit for on three kinds of previous work. One are sparse sampling methods, which includes the visibility PRM and the sparse algorithm. And our algorithm differs by leveraging sparse work methods for multi work optimization. Our work is also related to topological methods like homotopy, homology, or brains. However, our method differs by explicitly defining modes relative to the given optimization algorithm. And our work, work is therefore, therefore uh, directly related to path and trajectory optimization and methods like CHOMP, STOMP, KUMU, TREDGEOPT, or Gaussian process planning. And our method differs by providing a shared framework in which any of those methods could be used for optimization, but with asymptotic guarantees. And here we show a simple visualization of our algorithm running on a Taurus, where we like to move a point robot from a green star to a red gold state and where our cost is to minimize path length. And you can see that our multi-mode estimation algorithm iteratively converges to the modes of this path optimization problem. And the algorithm estimates those modes um, based on two pillars. The first pillar is a sparse roadmap, which we grow on the robot state space. From the sparse roadmap, we propose paths to a multi-mode database, and we iteratively update those paths using a given optimization algorithm. And our main theorem states that we can find all modes which have a certain neighborhood size delta, and the clue is that delta is a parameter of the algorithm, which can be made arbitrarily small. We then evaluate, evaluated the algorithm on four topological spaces, namely uh, punctured versions of the sphere, the Mobius strip, the Klein bottle, and the torus. And the algorithm can robustly estimate all modes while taking roughly between 8 and 62 seconds of runtime until convergence. And in conclusion, um, we introduced a multimodal optimization framework uh, which combines sparse roadmaps and path optimization. Uh, we also provide an asymptotic convergence proof and we are currently have ongoing work to extend this uh, research to higher dimensional spaces. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick sit to the next video. <laughs> I'm Julio Nurain, a PhD student from TU Dumpster, and I'm happy to present my last work on learning stable vector fields on smooth manifolds. In order to understand how the presented work is related to robotics and why learning vector fields in smooth manifolds is essential for robotics, let me try to break down the title. Why do we need stable vector fields in robotics? Vector fields can be applied as motion generators in robotics. They bring us the promise of telling the robot what is the desired velocity in every single state of the state space. In case of a fully controllable system, we can define motion generation to set the decided velocity of our robot in each configuration and track the decided velocity with a PD controller. Additionally, we may be interested in defining stable vector fields. If we think in most of the tasks the robot performs, the robot motion can be thought as a motion generated by a stable dynamical system. In this way, there has been a way of research in modeling structured policies that guarantee the global stability. A family of modeling uh, stable vector fields is the one based on diffeomorphisms. These methods consider a latent simple linear dynamics in the uh, latent space and deform the state space itself to follow a desired trajectory while remaining stable. But one of the main limitations of these vector fields is the space in which they are defined. If we want to model a vector field in the end effector of the robot, we can define the vector field in a three-dimensional Euclidean space, but what about orientation? The robot orientation exists in a non-Euclidean space as SO3 for rotations or S3 for quaternions. Rotation over pi and rotation over minus pi will take us to the same position and thus we need to take this information into consideration when modeling our vector fields. 
That's where the second word for the title comes into play, a smooth manifold. In our work, we propose to learn stable vector fields in non-Euclidean manifolds to be able to represent motion for orientations. Let us assume the case of SO3. Any element in SO3 is a 3 by 3 matrix that represents any rotation in the robot in a 3D space. Or what about S2 manifold that represents any point in the surface of a sphere? How can we define uh, stable vector fields in these manifolds such that any point moving along these vector fields will remain inside the manifold? In our work, we show that we can apply a similar approach to the diffeomorphism based stable vector fields. Given a latent stable dynamics in the manifold we are interested, we can obtain nonlinear stable vector fields in the original manifold by applying a diffeomorphism between them. So the question to answer for us is, how can we learn those diffeomorphic mappings that satisfy the manifold constraints, such as we can apply a similar approach to the one introduced in Euclidean domains? In our work, we use uh, local coordinate charts to learn diffeomorphisms. For any smooth manifold, a local chart will pick points in the neighborhood of a point in manifold and represent them in the Euclidean space. Then, given this local coordinate chart, we can learn a bounded diffeomorphism between both Euclidean domains and inherit the transformations to the manifold. Hi, thanks for introducing our topic. Here we propose the geometry metric for cluster of kilometric systems. It can enable real-time control and online optimization. Let's consider this kind of systems. Um, x store equals to j times u. It can cover the systems on SU2 and SO3. If we only use the kilometric control, uh, it's, uh, it's uk equals to j spheres times lambda. Lambda is an error vector here. Uh, the error vector lambda may fall into the log space for J spinwards. Uh, let's take a look at the geometry analysis on standard kilometric control. The error vector lambda uh, can be projected the log space to obtain the lambda p. Uh, so we propose the uh, uh, geometry metric called as the log space of one's margin. Uh, this margin describes uh, how far the error vector away from the log space. Uh, if beta equals to zero, uh, the error vector lambda has fallen to the log space. If beta equals to 90 degree, the error vector is perpendicular to the log space. This is a perfect case. Next, we define drive vector. Uh, this vector is expect, is, uh, expect to drive the error vector to be perpendicular to the log space. So we propose the uh, log space of valence controller here. And uh, the NSA based uh, cool. the control just uh, combine, uh, combines them together. We tested the uh, uh, proposal controller on a highly dynamic robot, uh, for example, a falling carry robot. Uh, during 0.5 seconds, uh, it is expected to use a two soft tail to control three soft uh, body orientation. If we only use a standard kinematic control, here, you will see that uh, the robot would get stuck. And without controller and the robot, uh, the body orientation, uh, could be stabilized. We also test our controller on a tail wheel uh, car. Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing project. Uh, you could see the body orientation could be stabilized by, by the tail and the wheel together. Uh, in spite of that metric, we propose an NSA uh, QP. Uh, uh, to our best knowledge, it's the first time to apply the QP uh, to the stabilization of a uh, uh, non-homic system. Uh, from the re uh, experiment result, uh, you will see the robot could reach the target and uh, the control input would respect the uh, uh, limitations. We also proposed the NSMPC. Uh, besides the quadratic index, uh, we also introduced the NSM margin index here. Uh, uh, you could see the robot uh, could reach the target and uh, at the same time, the state and the input constraints are with it, respected. Uh, this is all my presentation here. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, I guess we have uh, we have a little bit of time for questions for the first three talks. Um, uh, 
I see um, there was already a question for Andreas. Andreas, if you if you want to uh, elaborate more, the question is how do you sample from the manifold? Uh, I guess you put the question on the chat, but uh, if you want to talk a little more about it, that, that should be fine. Yeah, um, so it's actually not so so trivial, of course, to, to sample uniformly from a manifold, and you need that for uh, doing motion planning, of course. Um, and the trick which we use is basically that we uniformly sample the parameterization of the manifold itself. And then we just penalize um, samples which are in a low curvature uh, region of, of uh, the manifold. And this actually gives you um, a pretty good uniform distribution over the, uh, over the manifold. And there's also a paper which I just uh, put into the chat um, where you can read more about um, this approach to uh, uniform sampling on arbitrary manifolds. Okay, great, thank you. Have, um, can, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, can, yeah I have a small extension to, to that question. That, uh, when you mean parameterized uh, representation, it's some kind of a coordinate chart in which you have a kind of a Euclidean representation, or how do you, what do you mean with parameterized representation? Uh, yeah, so in, in our case here, with the four topological spaces which we used, um, it's basically a two-dimensional surface. Um, so we have like a, yeah, two parameters, um, which parameterize, uh, parameterize this manifold. And um, yeah, we basically use, use that to, to actually uh, define the manifold. Uh, yeah, Th does that answer your question? Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. I will also I will check the paper also. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Then uh, we have a question for the second talk. Uh, it says in your work you use normalizing flows to represent the diffeomorphism. However, it is known that such models are often very hard to train. So, is this the case for the neural spline flow that you used? May uh, may it be possible to use simpler models, uh, which are also more data efficient. Uh, yeah, so with respect to the question, it's actually uh, probably yes. Uh, it will be maybe easier to use other type of diffeomorphic functions. While on the other hand, like I was not, I was not able to find out like some kind of parameterized representation of diffeomorphic function that is maybe sufficiently rich in order to to consider also bounded bounded representation bounded uh, diffeomorphism because uh, all the diffeomorphic representations that I was kind of aware of um, were mainly explained, represented in the whole uh, Euclidean domain. And, 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 and therefore, I was not able to satisfy the stability with, with that. Anyway, uh, the neural splines are not in particular. Uh, I, 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 not, I mean, they have like tons of parameters, that's true, but they are not particularly hard to train, or I didn't have that experience. But, yeah, I don't know if, you, if it's okay, Leonardo. Yeah, thank you. I, mean, so much. I, I think that's oh. fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, great. Maybe at the interest of time, we should uh, move on to the next uh, set of talks. I am Bertolt Bongard, robotics lecturer at Technical University of Braunschweig, and I'd like to advertise our poster, A Perspective onto the Structure of Motions from the Viewpoint of Dualization. In robotics, we are facing computational challenges, for example, with the inverse kinematics problem of kinematic chains and the forward kinematics problem of parallel linkages. Generally, it requires to state and to solve a variety of geometric constraints in robotics and to solve as many problems as possible in a global and efficient way. Next to these practical tasks, we can ask principal questions. For example, what are characteristic geometric and topologic features of the group of rigid body motions, and what are appropriate computation models to specify their six degrees of freedom, and which models can be described in the language of linear algebra? Reasoning about three-dimensional space, it is common to consider the flag of its elements, made by points, spheres, planes, and frames, where a sphere denotes an oriented line, the span of a pair of points. Less well known might be the similar construction concerning the space of orientations, where directions, great circles, and orientations build a flag. 
facing these two overviews, we can state that two points are separated by a distance and two directions are separated by an angle, whereas two spheres are separated by an angle and a distance. It's a classic finding that the angle and the distance separating two spheres are unified within a dual number quantity. The dual number unit epsilon is that number that squares to zero. For applying dual number algebra to geometry, it is worthwhile to consider the interrelations of the elements, points, directions and spheres carefully. The main guidance for using dual number algebra for geometric reasoning is given by the principle of transference. It states that algebraic identities of ordinary trigonometry also hold true for dual angles. If we apply this principle, we can reveal different types of rigid body motions, their representations and interrelations. We can further draw practical implications concerning the modeling of spatial linkages, their closed form kinematics, and their singularity analysis. Thus, if you like to know more about this approach, you are certainly interested in our poster. Hello everyone, I'm Arvin Rasulzadeh and today I want to present my research under the title of Design and Path Optimization of Linear Pentapod based on the geometry of their singularity varieties. The main purpose of this research is to present an algorithm which as an input would take a non-singular motion path of a parallel manipulator and return a motion path that has increased its distance to the singularity variety while performing the smooth motion based on user's request. Naturally, like any other algorithm, we need a proper testing ground for this algorithm. Due to some computational advantages, we chose this testing ground to be the class of linear pentapodes. But what are the linear pentapodes? A linear pentapode is a five degree of freedom parallel manipulator consisting of five legs in which each leg is, consists itself of two spherical joints and one prismatic join, joint in between, where the spherical joints are passive while the prismatic joint is active. In this case, we will have five degree of freedom motion consisting of three translations and two rotations. In fact, we also have an uncontrolled rotation around the linear motion platform. But due to the fact that these kind of manipulators are mainly used in industrial tasks such as drilling and piercing, uh, this uncontrolled rotation is irrelevant. In general, the set of singular poses of such a manipulator is described by a polynomial called singularity polynomial which in the case of, the, in the case of uh, linear pentapodes, it is cubic and non-homogeneous in pose variables. In another word, it forms a hypersurface in fixed dimensional space. This itself yields a rather complicated mathematical problem. However, it is possible to resort to a simpler class of these pentapodes by putting some ar ar architectural restrictions on the design of these pentapodes in such a way that the resulting singularity polynomial would be linear in position variable or linear in orientation variable. From now on, we call such a manipulator a simple pentapode. Having such restrictions allow us to have a lot of computational advantages dealing with these pentapodes, and which would make the simple pentapodes a perfect testing ground for our algorithm. However, since our algorithm based, uh, is very much based on the distance to the singularity variety, we need a measuring system that would allow us to know how far we are away from the singularity variety. A suitable candidate for this case would be an object-oriented metric, which takes the shape of the manipulator into account, and it measures the distance 
between two poses in R3, while the result is also interpretable in R3, in our real world. Um, the metric is this, the design in this way, that it would be the one-fifth of the sum of the corresponding distances between the spherical joints on the motion platform in two different poses. As you can see in the picture between pose one and pose two, the length of the dashed lines will be summed and will be uh, multiplied by one fifth. Now having access to enough information about our singularity and variety and knowing our distance function, our optical oriented function, we can now do the uh, path optimization. Now assume a given non-singular motion path of the simple pentafold is our impulse. Then our algorithm is able to increase its distance to the singularity variety to create a motion that would increase its distance to the singularity variety while creating a smooth motion. This algorithm functions based on the cost function that encodes the curve energy, bending energy, and the distance to the singularity variety, which itself is the uh, object oriented metric. Now assume that we have a non singular path. Then an, our algorithm somehow allows the motion path to learn how to increase its distance to the singularity variety, which would be a motion of this kind, which visually one can confirm is highly non singular due to the fact that the yellow platform is not coinciding with the red one. We can even consider the uh, prismatic joint limits into account, which as you can see, the curve learns not to exceed the prismatic limits. As soon as it gets close to the prismatic limits, it would slide on the clear portion while remaining non-singular. We can also consider the base joint limit, which is modeled by cone, which we will slide over the cone as soon as we get close to it. Or we can even consider both restrictions. You can see it slides over the cone and as soon as it uh, reaches the, the sphere portion, it moves tangent to it. For the moment, the algorithm works for a simple pentafold and three RTR manipulator, but we are including more complicated machines, but one must have in mind that more complicated machines means more of singularity variety, complexity, and difficulty. For the moment, we are planning to include Bertin images and numerical software to achieve our goal. I thank you for your attention. Hi all, it's a pleasure to present to you my work on slotting cone based robust limit cycle control and its application on vector locomotion. The reason why we try to use limit cycle based control methods to control vector system, for example, in our work, we try to control system the hop in certain height and also certain velocity, is because limit system in general will have a deceleration and acceleration in when it contacts the ground. So naturally, from physics, we can observe that there is a cyclic trajectory. And also, when a system moves in a stable case, the cyclic trajectory will converge to a limit cycle. So our objective is to investigate the use of limit cycle phase control methods to enhance locomotion performance in terms of speed, stability, and most importantly, robustness. So here is a conventional expression of the dynamic of a spring mass system. So we turn it into a matrix form, representing x1 the compression of the system with x2 the velocity of mass. And you observe that the time derivative of this form will go to zero eventually with the force. So we try to find a control input that can drive the system to certain desired form. And hence, the desired form will indicate the takeoff velocity, and hence the maximum height that the system will achieve. Traditionally, we have sliding mode control that interpret as a strategy to construct a hardware plane with s equal to zero, which represents a stable linear differential equations that will converge to x equal to xd. The upload function will be a troll. So our idea is to make a hat shape the upload function and construct a sliding surface in a cone shape, and this intersection s equal to zero will be the desired data cycle. And hence, with the system 
converging to this design limit cycle, it will eventually take off and some design velocity will hence retrieve the design object height. Here is the derivation that proof that the stability can be achieved using this controller. So here is a simple test on the sliding bone control. We can see that with two different stiffness, the system using different force input to drive the system to hold to desired height. Since the radial direction of a planar hopping system is like a vertical hopping system with some disturbance from the Coriolis force from the angular motion, we simply use a SCC controller to control the radial direction to move inside of the cycle such that the takeoff radial velocity can be controlled. And using feedback linearization to control the angular speed, and altogether we can drive the system to take off at certain takeoff velocity, which will drive the system to call to certain speed and height. And here is the experimental result showing the system using the controller move from 0.5 meters per second to 1.5 meters per second at least, and while also maintaining the height. Another test would be the uh, robustness test. The system can jump over obstacles, move, move, move through tunnels, and hop on uh, unknown slipless surface, yet maintaining the uh, hopping motion. So here's all what I wanted to present. Thank you. All right. So um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for all the uh, presentations. Um, so now I think we can proceed with some of the questions that we have uh, for the speakers. Um, we do have some in the chat, so maybe I will start with uh, with those. Um, I just maybe want to start with uh, kind of a delay question uh, that came for, for Yulan. Uh, so maybe Yulan, you can address it a bit quickly. Uh, so since okay. any non-trivial manifold requires more than one shard to properly cover the entire space, how do you ensure you learn vector fields agree on parts of the shards that map to the same regions manifold? So in short, like basically, like we didn't actually explore like multiple coordinate charts in our work, even if it allows, because for the S2 sphere, we can have like actually a whole projection plane that has like pi, and maybe we only take the the antipodal point out of the manifold and we apply the diffeomorphism in the rest. And for SO3. Uh, SO3 can be mapped uh, to a ball in, in three-dimensional space with the axis uh, axis angle representation. And then we can learn actually a, a stable vector fields in the angle axis in the axis angle representation itself. And the only thing that we are leaving out is like the peer rotations. And but if we will have if but if actually the, the approach allows to actually combine multiple coordinate charts, but you should apply it sequentially. So you apply one coordinate chart, you apply some diffeomorphism. And then, and then if you sequentially concatenate them, then it should, it should allow to, to apply like different morphisms in the whole space. So yeah, that's for being okay. Long. Okay, thank you, Julian. I think that was actually very cool. Um, all right, so um, Philip, Philip uh, also asked um, for the talk of um, uh, Bungard. So could you please elaborate on how your perspective differs or complements models based on the study parameters? Yeah, I hope that you can hear me. Yeah. Fine. Uh, I just answered uh, also written. So there is no new representation in our work uh, at all. We just uh, somehow create an overview of what is uh, well known, let's say, and put it into context um, from our point in maybe a new summarizing perspective. and. So there was a misunderstanding, let's say, that I prepared um, a true poster and not a spotlight talk that you could visit if you like, if you click on that URL that I posted here. So also there, if you have further questions, you're um, uh, cordially invited to enter this room and maybe have a sub-discussion if you like. Sure, and maybe um, I have another question also regarding uh, your talk. So kind of uh, the part where I uh, struggled a little bit uh, regarding this dualization approach was uh, kind of the, the technical impact or applications uh, when compared to, to more classical approaches when it comes to analyze motions in robotics. So may you please elaborate on that? Could you uh, further explain what you mean? So uh, as I understood, or maybe I'm not sure if I, 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 uh, I missed some part of the, of the dualization approach, but uh, so I think that uh, in, in part of your talk, you actually um, uh, had a, in part of the slides that 
this dualization approach might have some impact, I guess, some improvements or maybe some uh, additional perspectives regarding how to analyze uh, motions in robotics. Um, so, so I was wondering like, uh, Mm -hmm. What what are the benefits or, or what is uh, kind of new or different uh, for, for when mm -hmm. it comes to analyze motions? So there is no new thing uh, from a functional point of view directly. It's just uh, the observation that dualization is a, let's say, a way of classification, let's say, All right. that you can find in the poster if you follow that up. And that can, uh, let's say, unreveal... Um, neighborhoodness and uh, relations among representations and so forth. And also what you can find out, you can write down, you find that then on the poster, you can um, compute, let's say, closed form uh, solutions for problems that have not been described in that compactness before. Okay. okay but there is not cool. that thing that immediately follows. Okay. Okay, that's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I think now there is a, a question for, for Arvin um, from, from Hans Peter. So are there examples of simple parallel manipulators beyond linear pentel plots uh, with more general constructions aiming at singularity varieties of low distance degree be uh, conceivable? Uh, well, I would like to respond that yes, they exist. Um, uh, I know that uh, actually when we use the simple pentaport for our algorithm, it was a, just a, a first implementation and we wanted to make a full simulation in order to know what would really happen when we do these things. Uh, this was the project that I did. After I finished this project, the project was passed to other people and they added, uh, as for the moment, it's being researched on. And uh, I know that the people who are working on it, uh, they, are, they have added the manipulators such as the simple case of 3RPR and the hexa put to it. Uh, this is a very natural question that whenever I um, present this algorithm, everyone asks if, if it can be really generalized because uh, in this fashion of presentation, it's uh, very much uh, stuck to the case of pentapods. Um, I would like to add that uh, regarding the metric that I used, uh, this metric is um, a few years ago, it was uh, somehow defined at uh, Vienna University of Technology by a guy named Hofer. And this metric depends and it does not necessarily depend on just uh, five breakpoints, and you can uh, take infinite numbers. So, because of that, you can take any motion platform for that metric if you use the generalization of what I just used for this case. Um, again, regarding the algorithm, this was one part. The second part is that uh, this algorithm is very much dependent on the singularity variety of the manipulator that you're using, because in order to be able to uh, wield it, uh, you need something uh, called the orthogonal projection on the, on the variety. And if your variety is, uh, of course, uh, complicated shape, then uh, you're going to have problems, uh, uh, like um, computational problems. We chose the case of simple pentapod for our first implementation because uh, in, in this way, for the orthogonal uh, projection, we had the symbolic coordinates of the, we, we had, in other words, we had the closed form solutions for the uh, projected points on the variety. So of course, if you take more complicated robots, this uh, orthogonal projection, you, you will have uh, problems in, 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 in computing it. But there is even a solution to that, that people who are working on this new project are now doing it. Uh, the solution to, to that is a software called Bertini, or there are also equivalent other softwares like Julia that would uh, do the, uh, this orthogonal projection. So yeah, this would be, as, as a short answer, I would give this answer, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Harvin. I think it was a very cool uh, answer. Um, so now I think that if there are no further questions from the audience, uh, I would like to, okay, I think that we have now. Um, okay, it was just a thankful note from um, Hans. Um, I guess that now we can move um, to the panel discussion uh, for the sake of time. Um, and um, in this case, I will, um, just uh, invite all the, um, all the speakers of the first session and of course, um, everybody that would like to, to bring up uh, any possible question to, um, to just, uh, of course, unmute and, and speak up. Uh, of course, everybody is, is welcome to, to contribute to, to the discussion.
Yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I will try to uh, like moderate the questions. Uh, uh, please feel, feel free to to ask anything that uh, you think is appropriate, uh, and we need to discuss. Uh, I guess uh, as a starting point, uh, uh, I wanted to follow up on this uh, this question that I asked uh, uh, Professor Laval in the beginning, uh, like how. Uh, like what geometry or topology should we teach in uh, engineering schools these days and uh, uh, how do we uh, move uh, toward uh, proper education uh, on uh, geometrical and topological methods. Uh, and uh, I, I know that this is a, a huge question, but since we have some senior people here like Professor Laval and uh, Professor Kaldicek, maybe we, we should touch base on that. So uh, either Steve or Dan, if you, if you have any comments, please go ahead. Um, well, let me. That's a very, very challenging uh, kind of question and problem. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the culture that that, that sort of has evolved for for decades uh, in the universities, and it also varies from country to country, and you know, field to field in a lot of ways. But but uh, it's not not such an easy thing to propose. And the question is, teach at what level? I mean, maybe teaching beginning graduate students that might be one way to look at it. Um, sometimes it's a matter of making sure that the program is flexible enough so that students can maybe take some courses in pure mathematics and um, other areas. I, I, I've always been, let's say, not much of a fan of applied mathematics courses where um, the people giving the course already think they know what the application people want. So I, it, it's much better to kind of get the pure math from the source. Um, then, of course, it's very challenging if you're competing with PhD students in mathematics or something in some of their courses. And there are some, once in a while some gem kinds of courses that are maybe advanced undergraduate level for aspiring mathematicians, but are still kind of, you know, not, not too horrendous maybe for engineering students to get into. But, but the most valuable time in my own PhD development was just being able to take, having enough freedom finally after my PhD qualifying exam to take at least a few courses in pure mathematics and, and study a few more, audit a few more. Um, I, I don't know what the modern equivalent of that is. I, I don't know where, where, you, where you get it from. Um, um, it's, it's, I could make a proposal that might solve the problem in 50 years, maybe, but you know, by, by sort of gradually transforming everything in the universities. But I'm I'm not sure how to how to solve that immediately. Yeah, I guess just, just following up on that. So, for example, here at Penn, I uh, I just had to go over at the math department and take a bunch of classes there. Uh, but do you think that this is the only way of doing that? Like, is there any way of integrating uh, these, for example, algebraic topology? Can can we teach it somehow at an engineering department? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it may be quite reasonable. I remember I remember uh, Mike Mike Erdman a long time ago started a course in mathematics for robotics, something of that sort of name um, at Carnegie Mellon, and um, he really wanted to do this kind of thing. So so I think it's possible for 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 uh, for for someone to kind of scoop up some pieces and 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 put them into into mathematic mathematical pieces and put them into the curriculum for roboticists. But it always runs the risk of the people are learning the parts that are already. Um, Sort of known to be useful, and and as a as a researcher trying to be really innovative and push the frontiers, that wasn't enough. I, I got the sense when I was in electrical engineering that all of the math had been kind of baked into the electrical engineering curriculum for so long that they weren't talking or thinking like mathematicians at all anymore. It was more like a show off kind of thing, like a bunch of big rigorous formal stuff, and we'll make you wake up at six a.m. and do push ups and Laplace transforms and you know all of this kind of stuff. And and when I started taking pure mathematics courses. I saw that they were drawn to some kind of beauty and, and um, asking very different kinds of questions than the engineers did. And once I learned that way of thinking, that kind of culture, that really helped change my, my way of thinking as I focused back on engineering again. And, uh, and that's a hard thing to, to sort of get. And, and um, um, it, it's hard to maybe trick or convince a pure mathematician into coming over and doing that and, and maybe focusing on the right kind of topics. It, it's just, um, yeah, I don't know sort of which way to go. It's like well, once it's been kind of boiled down and put it into a curriculum, yeah, it's good for teaching the things that are already known to have been useful, but, but it's not good for teaching this kind of essence of mathematics, which is some kind of search for, for quests for, to try to describe things in such beautiful, clean ways and, and have such incredible levels of generality that they may serve as mathematical models for your own field of robotics in ways that, that you couldn't have imagined before so, without having known that. And I'm dodging it all the time. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pursue uh, uh, Professor Laval's uh... Uh, comments uh, agreeing, uh, but in a different style. Uh, 
let, let's ob observe that 100 years ago, linear algebra was considered to be something completely esoteric. And uh, you wouldn't have ever seen engineers, you know, that was some exotic thing that the mathematicians did. But as Steve points out, over the ensuing 10, 20, 30 years after, by the, by the, by, by the end of the Second World War, we, were, we, we had come to realize in engineering that actually what we need is matrix algebra. We don't, you know, that, that's, that's the thing that's useful or that seems to be useful. And so we can teach that, you know, we can teach that to sophomores, uh, college sophomores. And, and now I think it's being taught in high schools. So the, that is the, the, the extraction of the computationally useful materials from what are presently considered to be esoteric methods will come as we in, in the, on the research side begin to formalize or begin to codify the pieces that are needed and extract them from the math curriculum. As far as researchers are concerned, uh, it's the obligation of researchers to be stretching themselves. So, 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 so there's no question that these the ideas that are that we can identify as useful and show to be useful after some decade or so will readily be transferable into the uh, you know the senior level curriculum and then you know then the junior level curriculum. Eventually, they'll come to the uh, first and second year programs. In contrast, um, it's the obligation of the researchers to be stretching themselves, whether into math or into biology. Math is not the only stretch. We, in, in, if, if, if robotics had been, if robotics had a sound, secure foundation as an intellectual discipline, it would be much less treacherous. It would still be challenging, but it would be much less treacherous for people to make these forays into um, the neighboring disciplines. It's very treacherous. You, you think you're going to, uh, you, you don't want to be uh, a second rate mathematician, you know? <laughs> uh, you, you want to be a roboticist. Uh, you want to learn the tools, or you don't want to be a pretend biologist. You want to be inspired by biology and serious biology. And so the research community, I think, will always be uh, forced uh, to stretch, and there are dangers in stretching. You get stranded. Uh, and become a second-rate person, you're the best tennis player amongst football players, or, or something like that. So, so I, I think inevitably the the methods from math that are obviously useful get enshrined in the curriculum, if there's a secure foundation, uh, which there's not in robotics right now. Thanks, Dan. I think it's a very good point, and I think I think that it's interesting your comment about linear algebra to, to matrix algebra, and I, I felt like you know as a student of engineering. They, I, I kept, they kept trying to turn me into a trained monkey to like do lots of computations by hand, you know, very fast. And, and I couldn't understand why all the time. And I got very nervous when I didn't understand because I didn't know what would happen if you changed the problem a little bit. I always worry that the essence of mathematics gets lost when it's brought into engineering curricula, you know, and maybe now that computers can do so much by themselves, you know, symbolic integration and all kinds of other matrix operations that, that we used to try to do by hand to show how smart we are. Um, um, maybe maybe engineering so sort of mathematical education can move beyond that and try to get more and more of the essence of you know getting the definitions right and and the, the logic and reasoning of proofs and things not proofs as a show off thing that you have to do at the end somewhere and it's very difficult and intimidating but but really it, it all the way through it should be this kind of thinking you know building it up from basic pieces defining things carefully and understanding what the axioms are that you get to work with and, and that sort of thing. I think that's what I learned when I started finally focusing on mathematics without any concern whatsoever for how engineers might use it. And I, I, I worry that that essence doesn't get baked into the engineering curriculum enough. Maybe, maybe it's changed since I was a student, but I, I doubt it. But anyway, this is one of my, I, I'd love for the essence of these kind of math, this mathematical way of thinking to become part of the core of robotics at some point. Doesn't mean everyone has to do homology or something, but, but, but it's just this way of thinking. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I see that Alex also has a comment. Uh, Alex, if you want to, uh, or any other person from the from the panel, if you want to contribute to that discussion. Alex is not there. Yeah, I would like I, I, to say something. Oh, is yeah, Alex here? Of course, go ahead. I don't know, it's just there. Okay, you should go ahead. Uh, I think Alex probably. Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, 
what I want to say, okay, I, I agree most of the comments I have heard already, but I think it's also a duty of the more senior people to kind of uh, draw the lines what we have to read or learn somehow. Because, I mean, you have the experience, you, you explained that already, but uh, by providing some uh, tutorials or some, uh, you know, notes that we can read so to get into algebraic topology, for instance, for me, just by hearing the words, I'm getting terrified. So I wouldn't start from scratch learning algebraic topology. By, but, you know, if you if people have already spent time on that and have already the high level idea what, what the engineering community needs to get involved, you know, with these uh, complicated uh, mathematical domains, it would be nice if you have the, the first hints or uh, tips or uh, first notes that I can read and get familiar with the topic. Yeah, I want to completely agree that we haven't done our job. We haven't even done the step of extracting the boilerplate stuff, for example, from algebraic topology in a way that could eventually be taught to sophomores. And um, here, you know, I'll plead guilty and I have many excuses, uh, but the, uh, uh, you know, I'll spare you my excuses. The, the challenge of, again is that there's no, there's no agreed upon disciplinary foundation. People don't think um, of robotics yet as a discipline and it's hurting the field very badly. It's hurting industry very badly, I think. Um, I, I wish, so in some sense, I think we elders have failed you even worse in not having established a clear definite or clear uh, set of boundaries uh, inside, outside interfaces to other disciplines in a way that would make it safe uh, and effective uh, for uh, people perhaps more clever at teaching than I uh, to begin to do the extraction and make some of the more exotic tools become less exotic. So I agree with you that we have, that there's a real problem here. Um, and I, you know, I hope that you, guys in the next you men and women and everyone in the next generation will not stand for this any longer and will insist that we say what the field is is there a field or is it just a, is it just a place where you know we have, we build gadgets because they're fun and uh engineers need to work with computer scientists to build these gadgets and so let's play in the sandbox guys that's that's where the uh, engineering schools and computer science schools think robotics belongs right now uh we we need to do better if we want the field to if we if we want the robots to be useful and explainable rather than simply useful then we better do that Yeah, I agree with everything that's, that's been said, and I agree with Dan that the, the, the we don't sort of have a well-defined core. It's sort of all over the place. The, the, and the, the sort of maybe lazy best thing I can do is just keep throwing books at students like, oh, okay, I think this is a reasonable introduction. You know, Kinsey's book on uh, geometry of manifolds is good if you haven't seen any manifold theory before in topology and stuff. It's a graduate, it's a UTM, not a GTM yellow book. You know, it's, it's I know it's readable. I've read the first couple of chapters. You can try that, you know, and come back to me in a week or two. And, you know, like in guiding at least graduate students, that's about the, the best I feel like I can do. But it's, it's very difficult. There, there's not something like, you know, maybe it's the benefit of hindsight. You know, control theory is very mature, so you can start off a conversation with x dot equals f of x u and kind of go from there, and differentiable manifolds and dynamical systems on that, and da 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 da, da. and um, and and um, you know, theory of computation very mature. Learn your Turing machines, and uh, you know, theory of computation kinds of things around that. There's a very well defined core and what things you need to build up to that. Um, I think there could be a very well defined core for robotics, but um, it, it's something I think we've, we've, we've struggled with as a community. I, I found it somehow disheartening over the years, it seems like there's more and more of a push for more and more experimental demonstration kinds of things. There should always be a whole spectrum, I think, in the community. I don't think every person should be an experimenter. Um, um, there needs to be kind of all sorts of people, people at the pure um, sort of, let's say, theoretical end and people in a very applied end and a lot of mutual respect across that, that spectrum so that um, you know one's not killing somebody else's paper. Um, saying you didn't do experiments or, or, or you have too much useless math and, and this is never going to be useful, blah, 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 blah. But, um, but, but, but I, I feel like there's, there's not enough support kind of across the whole spectrum and, and a tendency to be more and more towards um, 
applying a bunch of tools, making some sort of experimental system, and, and, and maybe not developing the fundamentals as much. Um, that might be said of many fields, maybe in engineering that have progressed over the last 10 or 20 years, I would say there's much more of a tendency to build stuff. Than, than we see a question from Claire in the- uh, Yeah, uh, you should go chat. ahead, unmute yourself. Oh yeah, I was just kind of relating to the idea of the community and where things are developing and where we see things going. So I think like robotics is difficult because a lot of us don't get introduced to robotics even as like a concept until we're quite senior. Like at least in my experience, like like you're not allowed to like take any robotics courses until you're like a senior in college at the very least, um, or like you're like doing a master's or something like that. And uh, so like there's already like a lot of hurdles that need to be jumped to even like think of robotics. And then beyond that, if you want to have the mathematical foundations, you have to build on top of that. Um, and right now, like if you just look at the RSS like main conference breakdown there's this huge wave of like takeover of learning. And I don't think mathematical models and machine learning are like mutually exclusive at all, but there's like this big shift, I think in the broader community of robotics. And it, it feels like as we're trying to build up this community of people that are interested in geometry and topology for robotics, like how do we kind of marry the, the movement of the big community of robotics and the movement of what we want to grow into so that it, like we don't kind of get washed out as time progresses. So, uh, look, I, 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 I'd like to challenge you wonderful young people. I, I've laid out in, you know, in somewhat pedantic terms, I guess, my, my understanding of what the discipline is. And my challenge to you is kick that thing. Take, that, take a paper like the one that I'm advertising in this talk that you were kind enough to invite me to deliver to you. I mean, I'm advertising a very specific view of what the discipline is that's quite different from any other discipline. It's a new synthetic science, blah, 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 blah. T take that challenge and, fi and figure out what's missing, either what's wrong in what I, you know, if it's gonna be a science, it's gotta have an empirical component as well as a formal component. It's gotta have theory, it's gotta have a connection to fundamental limits in the physical world. All right, so, so I, the most I've been able to do, you know, is, uh, uh, is, is, is propose uh, what, it mean, what it would mean for robotics to be a discipline. My challenge to you guys is we, we know any one person is going to get it wrong. Uh, I'm sure there are things I've I don't think I've said anything wrong, but I'm sure I've left things out. Maybe I have said things wrong. My challenge is why don't you guys start now uh, um, pushing on the definition, not the definition, but on the articulation of what it is about robotics that is different from and has a solid intellectual claim to people at the undergraduate level, people at the master's level, people at the doctoral level. We, we haven't done enough of that. Certainly the oldsters haven't done that. Uh, I finally got you know frustrated enough to do it. Um, I believe we need to do a lot more of that. And this is a great group, this group kind of group. Uh, would be great to show what I got wrong, you know, what I left out, what I didn't understand, uh, what's missing. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Andreas, do you have any any comment on that? Uh, well, more like a, a general comment. Um, so, what really helped me, or what I find super interesting on, uh, yeah, in ge geometry and topology, is really this idea of having like a mental image of something and uh, this is something which I have seen in so many also math oriented books that people try to build up a very complicated mental image of a, of a specific concept and um, yeah this whole um, yeah view of, of, of thinking about a problem in terms of like building this mental image of like really understanding something in terms of mental images this helped me like a lot and this is also something which really has drawn me towards topology and geometry. And um, yeah, I, I think this is also something which we could maybe like give to the next generation that um, yeah, engineering is not like a set of like tools in your toolbox, but also like maybe this yeah, view of yeah, having mental images which you try to build up in your head to, to deeper understand the problem before you apply some kind of random tools. Uh May I uh, also interject? Uh, Andreas, uh, I thought an interesting thing that perhaps connects to the discussion is uh, what you said about language. So um, I think 
a lot of this boils down to whether we're speaking sort of the same language. Maybe we talk about the same problem and maybe even about similar tools, but perhaps just because the formalization of things is not exactly at the level that we would have hoped for, uh, maybe we are having some parallel conversations and we just get lost on what we're saying. So I was just wondering if you could, uh, you know, perhaps elaborate on that. Uh, I mean, you, you talked about how fiber bundles ended up being, in your view, uh, a, a nice abstraction. Uh, you had this nice uh, image of the elephant and how different aspects uh, in different disciplines uh, are, are described with different words. And perhaps there's, there's a problem in the vocabulary that is used that sort of prevents uh, some nice uh, conversation. And maybe this, this is exactly the same thing would, you know, trying to approach here in this conversation? Yeah, um, so that's definitely an interesting question. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the longer you work on a topic, the more you uh, find out what is actually the underlying structure of things. And the more you also see, okay, what, what kind of mathematical uh, fields or languages are appropriate for a specific problem which you work on. and um, yeah, I, I guess also for me, mathematics is a little bit um, some kind of like elaborate language of describing things. And uh, yeah, for me, this is really something where you have already this whole vocabulary for, for very specific structures, which we have here in robotics and why not yeah, using this, this language, right? Um, this is, I, I guess, what you wanted to like but I think one of the problems is that right. we don't use the same language. So for example, in, in our lab, we talk about template, templates and anchors. Uh, Andreas might think about fiber bundles. Uh, it's like, I don't think we have uh, a common theme to describe different layers of abstraction, basically. Uh, so I don't know if you have any comments on that. Anyone from a panel? Mm, uh, me or uh, anyone from uh, not to use up all oxygen in the room. I have plenty to say, but I'm trying not to use up all the oxygen. In the, in the <laughs> Very kind. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess. Yeah, I guess it also depends on what kind of application you have, right? Um, I guess with templates and, and anchors, you you have maybe yeah, so different applications in mind than I do. I asked this specifically because in your talk, uh, you, you 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 make a brief uh, introduction, you know, exactly about this problem, where you you know you touch different uh, pieces of the elephant, and you you can never describe mm -hmm. the, the the whole thing by itself. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and also I guess the problem is that um, if you go into a very specific problem, maybe you need a different language to describe what you actually try to solve uh, there. And then maybe if you go into a different area, you have you, you need a different language for that. And and yeah, I, I guess I don't yet know the answer to yeah to, to that. Can I then intrude and insist that the language please, please. is extremely important? And I, I, lo I love this aspect of your talk, but also, Andreas, that you were talking the need to articulate what you mean by multi level and, and, the, and the formalism of fiber bundles is a very effective tool. What, what, I'm, what, I, what I'm proposing is that, um, yes, these things uh, help us organize our thinking. Yes, the languages help us organize our our communications with each other. I'm, I'm claiming that these objects are embodied in the physical world. It's more than just what's in our head. I'm arguing, I'm claiming that the, the objects of topology, for example, of basins of attraction are physical objects and admit of a mathematical description. And it's our job to connect the abstractions of our thinking to the empirical world, to the physical world. Otherwise, we're not a science. And so it's, it's much, much more than, as it, although it includes, it helps us think better to be, to be formal. It's crucial for us as a science to articulate what, which mathematical objects correspond to which physical objects and which physical phenomena. What are the measurements, right? Um, 
And the learning people are doing that in a way that we had done for, I think the learn the development of learning is thrilling, fascinating, but of course, you know, it, it, if it's done in a thoughtless way, oh gee, these are good function approximators, <laughs> uh, which is unfortunately what one sometimes feels. Uh, there's no understanding of what those function approximators are for, or what their limitations are, or what objects they represent in the physical world, or what objects in the physical world that are important they can't represent. And so I, the, the, the burden on us as, as, as researchers is to use whatever tools, in mathematical tools or tools of biological thinking, evolutionary thinking is a very different way. It's a, a, a historical theory seems like an oxymoron, but that's what the biologists have. They have a, a, a historical theory of, of, of the way architectures are organized. Uh, uh, I forgot who else mentioned uh, Herb Simon. I think Andreas, you also mentioned Herb Simon. S Simon urges us to think about the interface between the architectures and the environments, which we don't do enough of. Um, and so these, these, these things are not just in our heads, or if they are just in our heads, then we're never going to organize ourselves science, uh, into a science. Maybe I can jump in here also uh, concerning language communication. I think we have also in the speakers some nice examples of uh, people from machine learning who came and uh, were able to to actually apply their techniques in collaboration with roboticists. So um, maybe Georgios so or Slava, you want to, to also comment on that? What is for you um, from the pure machine learning field to come somehow to the robotics and to also um, integrate your, your techniques there with us? Yeah, if I can say my experience, I think, you know, in the beginning, it felt like, as you said, uh, an application, uh, an application feel like take something we developed in machine learning and try to apply that to a robotics task. But, uh, you know, staying more and discussing more potential uh, ideas or, uh, you know, problems that appear in the meantime, I've slowly realized that as you, you know, all this conversation, what is about this is indeed something that it's not directly an application of machine learning, but something more like if you want to control a robot arm, it's not only then the factor that is can be a point in a machine learning perspective, but can be like the whole joint space and how all this system will uh, have to work on the same time, right? It's not only some data that we get uh, to train a model, as Daniel said. So it's not like a function approximator after all. We have to do some more thinking on that. Uh, as regards the language, I have to agree with, I think, everybody in this group, but in general, in science, it's very hard nowadays. The fields are going so fast that uh, you read papers from your own topic, and after a couple of years, you don't even uh, know how many similar papers have came out. So uh, I think it's hard to stay or keep up with the flow and uh, and uh, learn all the terminology and all the language, but I definitely agree that at least what is missing from me is when I was in the school, we had some first textbooks or some first notes. That, that's what I had. Uh, that's what I said in the beginning, that we had something to start with. So if I have to study robotics, I don't have to spend like months to start to get the terminology, the notation, the the language to to get to put my hands in a problem. But having something that will help me to to start from a good start. If this makes sense, what I mean, and I agree with you that terminology sucks not only in robotics but in machine learning. If you go from, you know, causality, machine learning, geometry, everything, everybody just his own or her own uh, language uh, way of thinking. Maybe one uh, remedy in this problem is when you write a paper to be very explicit. At least that's what I'm trying to do. Like try to not use uh, overloaded words and uh, assume that the other person understands what I'm writing, but try to simplify as much as possible my theory, either in the paper, either in the appendix that, you know, when I'm writing a term, try to explain what this term means and not just use it without any further notes. So, yeah, all in all, I agree that in all the machine learning or related sciences nowadays, it's a problem of language or terminology or whatever. I think one, a realistic solution is when we write papers, try to be explicit and as much as more informative as possible. My realistic, at least, approach.
I would like to make, make a comment based on um, um, what, what, what Dan was saying about the physical world and, and as well about, you know, um, but whether it's machine learning now or in previous years, there would be people and so computational geometry came along and said, so, well, you know, robotics is an application field and, and why this tends to happen. And I, I think largely if, if you look at the, you know, say the Turing machine model and the foundations of computer science, it's beautifully formulated to abstract away the physical world and forget about it to make everything work perfectly. And then you can develop a whole field of algorithms on top of that. And, and, and it leaves you with the kind of feeling that you can conquer almost anything with algorithms. And then when you come to um, to robotics, oh no, it's actually a complicated mess with you know the, the the physical world coming in. There's sensors causing trouble, giving you know they can't measure everything, and when they do, they make mistakes. And there's quantization and so forth, and control and dynamical systems, more problems. All the physical world comes back into play again. And it's and people will say you know there's cyber physical systems. Oh look, we forgot about the physical world. Well, it's always been there, and there's been people working on. You know, developing controllers and that, that work with with mechanical systems and things like that. But I think it's it's very easy because I've been both in and out of computer science for quite a bit, and it's very easy to to. That's all the same thing in virtual reality. A bunch of computer scientists think they can program their way out of everything. You know, like all the virtual reality problems. When in the end, it was optical engineering and optical science, and then manufacturability of devices that ultimately caused the this big wave to slow back down again and go back into hibernation until it. Kind of until some of these fundamental questions get solved. So, so computer science gives you this feeling that you can kind of solve almost anything with with the kind of by developing the right algorithm and computational tool. But then, but then you realize, um, especially in robotics, you know, it, it's just one piece, and and it's not even clear what you should be computing um, until you see the big picture. And it's very hard to do that. So, I, I think we always welcome people to come into our field um, and 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 bring fresh tools and fresh ideas. But it often progresses by having healthy interaction and understanding each other's problems and. And, and, and what's really what's really driving the roboticists? What questions are they trying to ask and what problems are they trying to solve? Which um, it's not purely an algorithmic one. The physical objects of the computational world are basins in one dimensional networks, graphs, if you will. And because all, all they need to do is exchange information, their abstractions have been ex extremely successful. Our our physical objects, of course, mechanical circuits, which is the beginning of our physical objects, uh, have much, much, much richer adjacency, much more complicated adjacency. And um, they're not going to be, we're going to be exchanging jewels as well as bits. That's our job, right? And um, the the mathematical objects that describe the physical objects relevant to the organization of exchange of jewels are very much under contest right now. We can learn a lot from computer science and I urge that we do just as we can learn a lot from mathematics. But I, I keep hoping that the field will develop in a scientific manner. That is by keeping, by focusing the attention on the physical objects that it's our job to organize and program. Uh, those physical objects are different than the objects of information exchange. And so I, again, I urge all of the, these powerful young people <laughs> in this whole meeting to don't just be an applied mathematician. Don't just be an applied, be a roboticist. Let's, let's have you come join us and be thinking about the physical objects that are under inquiry and what are the right mathematical abstractions or the right computational tools to manipulate those physical objects and make those physical objects useful and, and reliably explainable. Okay, great. Uh, I guess in order to close the discussion the same way that we started it, uh, so I noticed that Philip, for example, has exposure to both uh, graduate education in uh, the North American system and in Europe. So I was wondering, Philip, if you if you have any any comments on uh, on the differences there, and uh, like especially when when uh, uh, considering uh, geometry and topology, like if, if, uh, do you feel that uh, uh, there are differences in the approach of the European model versus the North American model? Uh, welcome to comment on that. Mm. Yes, so I think, especially since I, I come from uh, from kind of a more, I guess, uh, 
former uh, former a former socialist country, and I think a lot of the university systems there uh, focused uh, like there there was kind of a focus on rigor and on maybe on 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 conveying the maximum amount of information about kind of a certain topic within a course while in the north american system what i noticed is things are a lot more practically oriented and i think both um both uh kind of approaches both situations i find to be uh, they have certain they have their own advantages but well to put it in simple terms i i found the european system or at least the european system in which in which i was kind of uh, brought up um, to sometimes be difficult for difficulty's sake, uh, sometimes to be just uh, difficult without maybe focusing on actually kind of teaching you how to how to use uh, how to use these things, while and especially like focusing on you understanding the basic concepts. While I think. The North American system, from the, from what I've experienced, um, and even I think in uh, the 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 system in Western Europe, um, focuses more on you grasping the the basic concepts, like really kind of understanding the the fundamentals of a topic, uh, and then not really going that much into um, into specifics. And just one more thing, I guess, as we were kind of talking about, the, I guess, the need to maybe introduce more core um, mathematical topics in in uh, in robotics programs. Um, I don't know how relevant this is, and of course, I'm like nowhere near as experienced uh, in these things as the rest of uh, speakers, as the rest of the speakers in this workshop. But the, the thing I really liked about robotics is the fact that it that looking at practical problems introduced me to a lot of these deep mathematical theories. So I never really um, I, I never really had an interest in uh, a bunch of the like in 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 a lot of these mathematical theories in these in in some of these math fields of mathematics until I came across uh, these things in the uh, specifically inverse kinematics and, and kind of task space control for manipulation and locomotion and such. And so, yeah, so I think maybe, maybe a way to improve uh, robotics programs, but maybe I, like I said, I, I, I definitely, um, I'm not too experienced, but maybe make it easier for students to to jump into to jump into these mathematical theories. Kind of formulate courses uh, by by kind of exposing doorways to deeper mathematical topics uh, through some uh, through specific problems. Uh, may be found in 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 a uh, in in robotics. Um, maybe there you could introduce them to to like mathematical terminology, and kind of show where that actually is on a, on a wider um, theoretical kind of landscape. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Um, so I think we're somewhat over time maybe 35 minutes over time so uh we should probably pause here uh Naomi, do you want to do you want to take over and uh explain the rest of the schedule yeah sure um so basically we're going to come back in two hours and 25 minutes so i know that for some of you it can be late but all of you that can make it we'll be glad to have you here again um we have just a quick question for all of you before uh, leaving you. So uh, with all the organizers, we discussed a bit and we were thinking that maybe we could do a special issue in one of one journal after that workshop. So we want to kind of see who in the audience will be interested by uh, submitting maybe a paper to that special issue. So I'm going to ask this question now. I'm going to ask it also at the end of the second session. 
it's for the people that um, may not attend both. So yeah, is there, I mean, you can speak up or just raise hand in the chat or leave a comment on the chat. Um, it would be great to know like who of you will be interested by such a thing. Or just tell us later. I mean, you can send us an email. Just yeah, let us know if, if you're interested, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, nice. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you again for right. Thank you to all the speakers, all the panelists, all the invited talks. Um, that was that was great. Yeah, thanks to all of you and hope to see you all in two hours and a half. And for those that uh, cannot come back, like, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the talks, for the questions, for attending. Um, I think it was really great. So see you, you in two hours. Much. Yeah, thank bye. You. Bye. bye bye. Bye. Um, welcome everyone to the second part of um, our workshop, Geometry and Topology in Robotics, uh, Learning, Optimization, Planning and Control, which is held um, in the framework of uh, RSS 2021. Um, so as uh, many of the people that are here um, now were not part of the first session, I'm going to say again a couple of, I mean, just a few words on, on why we wanted to do these workshops. Um, so despite the, the promises and the benefits of geometric and topological tools, um, those are often overlooked by roboticists. And this is due to various reasons, such as, um, for example, the required mathematical background or the lack of crosstalks between discipline. So the goal for these workshops and also really for this uh, second part of the live session is to bring together um, robotics researchers which are and which are not familiar with those methods uh, in order to to present and discuss existing solution, to pose new questions and to discuss different point of view about problem. Um, another very important goal of, for us today and for the workshop is to bring together also like a broader audience. Um, so we, by that, I, we mean like people from, for example, pure mathematics or pure machine learning researcher um, so that we can discuss with um, roboticists like the application of geometry and topological method in different fields and also how we can somehow bridge between these fields. Um, so the, I mean, the idea behind this live session is the same for this morning. So we really encourage discussion between people. So whenever you have a question, a comment, uh, just unmute yourself or um, type it in the chat or raise the hand um, and you can just uh, talk. So, um, the program for this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have first uh, a QA session for the invited talks of um, six of our speakers. And then we have a second uh, spotlight session for the, the um, accepted contribution to the workshop. And then we're going to have a panel discussion with all our speakers. And to close, we're going to have the award um, distribution and some closing remarks. Um, so with that, I can uh, give the floor to Leonel, which is going to handle the first um, invited speaker Q and A session. Thank you, Noemi, and hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, so it's it's my it's my pleasure to uh, share the Q and A for uh, Professor Alin Albu Sheffer. So uh, probably I won't give a very formal introduction about about him and his work because uh, for plenty of roboticists. I think that the name uh, of uh, Professor Allen uh, is always there when it comes to, to works in, in robot control, um, safe uh, human-robot interaction, soft robotics, uh, uh, human-inspired approaches in, in robotics. So um, it's definitely a, a pleasure to, to, have, uh, to have him here and to, to see his talk. Actually, it was very exciting. Um, and actually, just to give uh, a very, very brief uh, overview on, on his talk, about the geometry or nonlinear oscillation modes of robotic systems. Um, I think that broadly speaking, um, he was bringing um, uh, a differential geometry perspective to the problem of um, understanding the, the oscillation modes um, of uh, robotic systems with uh, definitely some applications in locomotion, in gate generation and analysis. And um, 
And with this, I will uh, I would like to encourage the audience uh, for those that might have some some questions to um, take the chance and to of course um, either uh, write the question in the chat or uh, or to speak up and unmute yourselves and, and ask directly the questions to uh, Professor Alin. So first of all, thank you, Alin, for being here. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation and for the for the great workshop. Uh, yeah, I, I succeeded to go through almost all, all the talks from, from this session, and it was excited. Uh, it was really exciting. So uh, I, I, I'm sorry I could not start earlier to get completely through because it's, uh, it's very interesting. So yes, I'm, I'm here for questions. All right. So I would like to start the, the Q&A with uh, one of the questions that we got uh, offline. So I think this, to give some context, this uh, question refers to the fact that during your talk, you were talking about uh, the analysis of robotic systems, mainly in the configuration space, so in joint space, and uh, specifically for uh, periodic motions. And the question refers to uh, if the dynamics uh, is analyzed in operational space, uh, may we use the same or probably similar Riemannian theory understanding to view the robot in effector as a point mass on a different uh, Riemannian manifold? Uh, yes, actually the short answer is yes. And uh, of course, I mean, if you look at configuration space of robots, depending if, uh, if you have uh, endless turning joints, then it's an n-dimensional torus, right? And if you, or it's a subspace of, uh, you know, uh, Rn, right? And if you are in configuration space, then, then uh, your task manifold is something, uh, again, a manifold, right? It could be SO3, it could be whatever task you have, right? Uh, if, if you have the, uh, you know, the standard bunny, then it's, it's that surface, right? Which is maybe equivalent to, to a sphere or whatever. And, and then if you talk about periodic motions or, or dynamic motions in general, right? It's just searching for the geodesics in that space. And if you have pure rigid body motion, as uh, I have um, pointed out in, in the talk, then are, they are the geodesics of, of the inertia tensor. And uh, if you have also some potential energy, assuming you have um, conservative systems, then they are the geodesics of, of the Jacobi matrix on whatever your task manifold is. That's, that's the question. And it does need, not need to be a periodic motion, right? So if there are periodic motions, then they have some specific properties that they are some closed geodesics or, or whatever, right? But you could ask also for, for other types of trajectories, which might be of interest. Okay, thank you, Alin. Um, I insist uh, if anybody else have some questions from the audience. All right, I do have a, it's kind of a related comment, probably this is more from my side. Um, so, I mean, part of your work has been also uh, related to, to uh, physical interaction. And when I was watching your talk, I was actually thinking like um, how these, um, so when you were showing actually this, this uh, um, quadruped uh, showing different kind of gates that came actually from these different uh, modes, I was wondering like, um, what do we need to do to include contacts um, and to understand the, 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 the um, how the manifold or how the, yeah, how the manifold actually is affected um, by the, the contacts that are uh, perceived uh, fr from the robot. So I'm just curious about how can we actually include this in a, in a, in a meaningful way in, in the formulation of the, of, the, of, the, of the problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually this is really ongoing work or even work we, we still plan to start, right? Because the modes I have described, they are, let's say if the dynamical system does not change right you have a dynamic equation and uh, of course especially for the quadrupeds you have the flight phase you have the contact phase so basically you have two different manifolds even the dynamics the order of the dynamics changes right if your ground fits are in contact with the ground you have some constraints so the, um, the order of the model is different than than in the flight phase and then you have this hybrid structure right where you have two different manifolds which which intersect and then you have to analyze the hybrid system, right, with, with the switching. And uh, yes, we just started looking into it. And uh, 
Of course, in another way, you could put it in another simple way and say, well, I actually model my ground interaction as a quite stiff spring, very stiff spring, and then my order does not change. And I have just, you know, my, my system, sure. which always has the 12 degrees of freedom. And then my potential is gravity plus the springs in the joints plus the spring of the ground. And I have just one system. Could be, could be an approach. Of course, this would lead to, you know, very stiff equations if, if your ground is very stiff. Or you go to the hybrid analysis, and then you need to extend this idea of the modes for the hybrid case where you are switching, right? I mean, there's plenty of theory for, for hybrid systems, how you switch. Uh, it needs to be extended to the modes. So we are looking into both right now, and we have to see what comes out. But it's it's very good point, right? Uh, because almost everything that I have shown in the theory is staying on one yes. system, on one dynamic system. Absolutely. Okay, I mean, it's good to know that there is a, a lot of things to do then in that, in that sense, and I think that's actually very nice. And, and probably on, 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 on a similar note, so there is another uh, question from, from the offline um, process, so I think it's kind of related. So um, may you please explain why we are only interested in simple linear modes as the ones highlighted in the graph for the double pendulum example? So I think it probably this refers to one of the plots that you had in the in the presentation yeah. where you were showing all the different modes there and you were actually highlighting a couple of them, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is actually all of that is really quite quite fresh work still, right? So uh, whether you know classical locomotion motions map to those linear modes or, or segments of of the <coughs> hybrid dynamics map to those modes. This is an assumption and we are still researching it. The motivation for looking for the simple ones is that we observe that they are related to, to what we know from linear systems, from for, for the linear modes, right? So you have a system okay. with, uh, I don't know, five degrees of freedom, um, you have five modes, right? If you linearize the system around, around the equilibrium, right? And what it turns out is that if you increase the amplitude and the whole rigid body dynamics comes into play, and then you don't have a straight line on which you stay, but those modes start to deform, right? And the simple ones are at least, you know, close enough to, to the equilibrium. They are just slowly deforming when you increase energy out of the linear mode. So if you would ask, you know, I have a linear system. I was even surprised about this conjecture, which is coming out from 1948, actually which says that uh, for a linear system with one equilibrium point and uh, you know, a, a potential which, which is closed, you should have also n nonlinear modes as you have n linear modes, right? So at least I, 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 you know, whoever I spoke in mechanical engineering, nobody was aware, aware of that because the way the okay. mathematicians presented, you know, it's, it's a bit unaccessible. So, you know, this is the most direct answer actually, right? because they are the generalization of the linear modes around the equilibrium. If, whether they are enough to explain locomotion or not, it's an open question. And then probably if it's not, then we need to go to more complex and more complex. But sure. our hope is that the simple ones are already providing lots of insights. All right, I think that's the most super exciting answer. I think that's, that's actually very nice. Um, does anybody have any further questions for uh, Professor Allen? All right, so I think that um, now we can uh, move on to the next uh, Q&A. Um, so I will just uh, hand over to, um, can I recall who is, I think it's Noemi, right? Who? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Professor Allen. Thank you. Thanks a lot also for the very good question. Um, so our next speaker was uh, Anne Lee from um, the University of Washington. So um, her talk was about safe and efficient robot learning using Riemann and motion policies. So she went in this talk from kind of the basics of forward kinematics um, until learning those Riemann and motion policies, um, which are a framework that in my opinion is mathematically very elegant. And we also have, um, I mean, her and she and her colleagues presented a lot of nice results on, on real robot with that framework. So yeah, we, we were very excited by your talk. So welcome first. 
Thank you for having me. Um, similar to Professor Arling, Arling uh, I really enjoyed watching all the talks from the workshop, and I'm really excited about discussing this very exciting topic of geometry and topology and robotics with everyone here. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we can go on with, with questions. So if any one of the audience has questions, I mean, again, I encourage you to just post it in the chat uh, and mute yourself and, and go ahead. Um, I will start with one of the questions that we got online first and, and really feel free to, to go on and, and um, put your question in the chat after. Um, so the question that we had was, uh, in which cases would you recommend to use a hand design and uh, remaining motion policy versus um, a new remaining motion policy that is uh, learned? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think on one hand, I would recommend using at least like hand designed or very structured policies for safe critical RMPs, for example, like collision avoidance or uh, satisfying joint limit. Uh, for example, in our case, we kind of use a barrier type Riemannian motion policies, meaning that the importance weight for the policy, which is related to uh, like Riemannian metric in geometry, will go to infinity uh, as the robot is approaching the obstacle, whereas the robot is approaching joint limit, so that we can actually mathematically prove that our system is guaranteed to be safe in the sense that not colliding the obstacles or um, not violating joint limits. So I think that's one, one thing to consider is that if there is some certain property you want your system to satisfy, then maybe you want to hand design or leaving very few parameters to, to learn. For example, um, you can choose like what is the like what is the distance that your con like collision avoidance uh, controller is trying to react very strongly or some smaller parameters like that. But I wouldn't recommend just learning a full RMP from scratch for those important tasks. Um, and on the other hand, there are maybe some other task RMPs like Go Attractor, which some it sometimes would be good if you can learn them because as a designer, it's hard to thinking about how those RMPs interacting with other existing RMPs. So uh, what we found really useful is to hand design an RMP at the beginning, but use learning techniques to fine tune those RMPs to improve the performance that we care about. Okay, thank you very much for that nice answer. I think it explains a lot. Um, again, I encourage anybody from the audience who has question to, to post it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I can I can ask a second one that was uh, asked offline. Um, so when introducing RMP into reinforcement learning algorithm, how are this algorithm modified? So for example, what does it imply for the PPU algorithm in the example that you showed in your talk? Uh, yeah, so basically we view like RMPs or like the RMP squared framework that I talk about in algorithm as a structured policy class, which I think would be like a replacement to like fully connected neural network. So this is a policy parameterization. And most of the reinforcement learning algorithm are pretty much agnostic to the policy parameterization. So the short answer is we can basically take all our algorithm and apply it to learning with RMP policy. So um, this is fine. Uh, I so one sort of like thing to consider is this question of continuous or this question of uh, stochastic policies versus deterministic policies uh, because RMP they are deterministic at least the current version. And many like planning or any many like reinforcement learning algorithms thinking are thinking about using stochastic policies. So basically, we kind of modified our policy to add like Gaussian noise into the learned inertia or importance weight matrix and the learned acceleration matrix to sort of like simulate that the fact that we have a stochastic policy. So that's kind of the modification we do like in our algorithm to kind of fit into the framework of RL. Thank you very much for that very nice answer, very complete as well. Um, does anybody from the audience has a question, a comment? 
Yes, Jenny. Can, can mm -hmm. I ask? Hi. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, I, yeah, I have actually a detailed question for Angshi that's kind of a follow-up to what, uh, it's, it's very detailed. So for that example that you showed, we compared the learned policy with the RMP one. I was actually wondering what specifically you learned there. So what were the open parameters there? Because it seemed like you give it the obstacles. Um, and then I was wondering if, if actually the basically the repulsive potential for these obstacles is what you learned or yeah I wasn't quite sure about that part. Oh, yeah so uh, for the example I showed for the RMP uh, one we fixed the collision avoidance and joint limit uh, controllers because as I mentioned before uh, we want the robot to have certain properties and we were kind of trying to ensure safe learning there uh, on the other hand. Uh, so basically those are fixed and we're trying to modify a hand designed uh, target attracting policy. So basically it's acting on the any factor space and trying to go to the goal. Um, and the input to that policy was the position uh, of the target and position of all the obstacles and the obstacle radius, because in that case, they were all like balls. So uh, radius would be fine. Uh, so, and the current position and velocity for the end factor. So uh, we are trying to use that information to predict what the importance weight for that policy is and what is the acceleration output by the policy. Uh, we also warm start that policy with a simple PD controller. So it kind of starts with some uh, good distribution so that the exploration problem wouldn't be too hard. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Um, so I think for time constraints reason, we can move on to the next uh, invited talk. So um, Hans Peter will be moderating the questions. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Bronstein from Imperial College in London. Uh, he gave a talk about geometric deep learning, the Erlangen program of ML. I immediately volunteered to, to host uh, the, the questions for this talk. Uh, even if I know nothing about uh, machine learning or deep learning, but I was so much attracted by the, the name Erlangen Programm and the title that I, I simply could not resist. Um, nonetheless, uh, it's not so important what I uh, like very much. It's very important what you like. So I really encourage you to ask your questions. Uh, and I'll pause for a moment and uh, look at the chat. No, I don't see anything. Nobody raises his or her hand. Okay, so I will I will ask the question, um, Michael. I was very uh, very much liked your talk and uh, the the approach you have to deep learning, um, but um, unfortunately you were one of the speakers who who uh, stuck to the time constraint we gave. And uh, at one point you stopped. And uh, at this point, I, I personally thought it would be very interesting from a geometrical or kinematical viewpoint. Um, so how, how, would, how would you proceed now with, with this deep learning um, policy, taking into account geometry or symmetry when it comes to, um, let's say, geometries which are really in Klein's Erlanger program, like, like, for example, SO3, which is elliptic plane, or like SE3, where we also have transformation, a transformation group act on the object. So could you, could you adapt such strategies to uh, these scenarios as well, and how would you do this? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Well, and uh, uh, maybe uh, I should apologize for a little bit arrogant uh, title uh, comparing ourselves with the, the great uh, Felix Klein and his uh, program that really uh, transformed uh, not only geometry, but also mathematics and physics. So uh, with continuous groups uh, uh, like, like what you describe, uh, basically we can uh, we can uh, uh, represent um, convolution type operations uh, on these groups. Uh, um, I showed the example of the sphere, I think. So it's uh, with, with the, the, the rotation group. So I think one of the, the, the key differences compared to, let's say, Euclidean convolutions that the input domain and the output domain is not necessarily the same. So if you make a, a deep neural network that uh, operates on uh, a certain domain and uh, uh, that has certain symmetry structure, the, the, if it's continuous group, let's say Lie group, that, that, is also, that is also a manifold, then the, the structure of this manifold, or even the dimension of this manifold, 
is not necessarily the same. So the next layer has to take as input some uh, some other object. Now, uh, one important thing that that is probably you, you you brought it up in the beginning. So uh, somehow the the, the the implicit assumption here is that the, the the group is sufficiently small and tractable in the sense that if it's a discrete group then, then the number of elements the size of the group should be small uh if it is a continuous group then the dimensionality should be small we cannot do integrals on a 10 dimensional space so um, yeah there, there are some some limitations uh, limitations to that okay thank you are there any further questions Just unmute yourself, that's easiest for me. Maybe. So, um, I, I may have a question. Yeah. So, uh, Michael, I, I really enjoy your, your talk. Um, I'm not really into uh, these geometric deep learning uh, approaches, neither. But something that I actually uh, enjoy from your talk is kind of this unified view uh, of uh, different kind of deep, deep, deep learning networks uh, architectures. And I think that um, is something that I actually enjoy a lot because that actually helped me to understand how other networks work, um, uh, just uh, kind of a building on this uh, common perspective. And I was wondering like, um, probably it's a kind of follow-up question from what Hans uh, just said, but um, in, in robotics, for example, they are, different kind of manifolds or many manifolds that, that we usually use. Like um, sometimes we, we work on the, um, on the manifold of SPD matrices um, in, in the hypersphere as well, um, as well as for example, the hyperbolic manifold. So, so there are some applications there or the Grassmann manifold. And I was wondering if um, in, in the context of your applications, you have also tried to explore uh, a little bit these, these uh, other kind of manifolds and trying to understand them as well in a similar, um, framework in the same unified framework that you have in mind? Yeah, excellent question. So I, uh, given that we are constrained in time, so let me talk about hyperbolic manifolds. So um, uh, in relation to graphs, in particular, uh, gra uh, uh, types of graphs such as social networks, what is called scale-free graphs. Uh, so there is a branch of network science that is called network geometry that, that uh, basically you can, you can prove that uh, graphs with these properties can actually be considered as a sampling of a hyperbolic space. Uh, one of the reasons, for example, how uh, it's easy to see that, that in such graphs, the, uh, the growth of the number of neighbors in a graph that uh, increases exponentially with the radius. So this has to do with the exponential volume growth of, of metric poles in this, in this space. So, so in, in a sense, this is a very natural space to represent graphs. Now, once you can represent the graph as a sampling of this space, basically, uh, in many cases, you can forget about the graph. So you have a continuous diffusion so graph neural network essentially does a form of diffusion and then you can regard it as, as a, basically you can write down the diffusion differential equation. So it's, it's a PDE. Then you can discretize it in different ways. So for example, uh, the, 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 the time dimension, discretizing it corresponds to the layer of a graph neural network. You don't necessarily need to, to have, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, this fixed notion of layers. So this will correspond to, to explicit Euler scheme for solving this diffusion equation. You can have adaptive methods such as uh, Runge-Kutta maybe with adaptive step size or implicit methods where you invert the diffusion operator. So in short, you don't have any more uh, uh, the notion of layers, you have the notion of diffusion type that you discretize differently. The more interesting part is the spatial derivative. So in graph neural networks, you usually, uh, you're given an input graph, right? With some features on them and then you diffuse these features. But many uh, methods, and I think I mentioned it in the talk, they don't stick to the given graph. They do some form of graph rewiring, either in the form of graph sampling or maybe using multiple filters. So once you think of your graph as a discretization of a continuous space, then graph rewiring essentially is choosing a different discretization of your spatial derivatives. You can actually, uh, we have, uh, actually in the, uh, in the upcoming ICML, we have a paper on um, graph neural diffusion PDEs where we uh, uh, say exactly this, the, the interpretation of GNNs. But we also have a follow-up paper where we diffuse simultaneously the positional coordinates of the nodes in the graph and the feature coordinates, so the, the, the features that uh, the, the node attributes. So if you're familiar with uh, the, the variational methods that were used in image processing in the 90s, so that's the, the graph analogy of the Beltrami flow. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was actually very, very insightful. Thank you very much. 
There is a question by Pavan Toraga in the chat, which is a rather lengthy question. And I uh, suggest that uh, we have a look at the chat and read the question. Maybe that's the most efficient way of uh, trans yeah. transferring this information. Yeah, so I can read the question. Physical nuisance variable symmetries invariance is a kind of relatively nicer way to be expressed as geometric constraints. Some of the larger unknowns that the vision community refers to as semantic variability, like objects that appear very different but may have the same functions, have not been able to be expressed via geometric approaches. What is your view about how to expand the discussion to these issues? Maybe a not too long answer because we have yet another question. Yeah. Okay, so short answer. So probably a short answer. I don't don't really know. I think uh, uh, also as I mentioned in the talk, uh, the uh, graph neural networks with latent graph construction are related to manifold learning. So this is what many uh, works in vision try to do. Basically, you you try to think of uh, your data, even though it's high dimensional, to have some intrinsic low dimensional structure, capture it in the form of the graph. So uh, that, that's where graph neural networks can probably give new life to to, to these kind of approaches. Thank you. And uh, Arlin has asked yeah. uh, has raised his hand, so please ask a question. Yes, um, very very cool talk. From what I understood, you are exploiting known mod. I mean, symmetries which you know based on some models, uh, based on um, a priori, you know, information about uh, about the structure. Um, what about searching in the data for symmetries and exploiting them in a subsequent way to, you know, I mean, using the same approach, but uh, uh, finding out symmetries you, you did not recognize a priori? Yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, well, again, in the, in the constraint of time, so this is, this is really uh, probably one of, the, one of the next challenges of geometric deep learning is how to find symmetry rather than, than hardwire into, into the architecture. So to some extent, maybe I should say that, that uh, you never have really an exact symmetry, right? So this, this uh, assumption that, that uh, you have exact invariance or equivariance is a wishful thinking. So uh, you, you need to have more properties than just invariance. So you need to have some form of geometric stability. Right? And for example, convolutional networks are, uh, you can actually show that they're stable under transformations that are not uh, exact uh, translations. So if you think of, uh, let's say, a video where you have two objects, one moving in one direction, another one in, in another direction, you don't have a global translation. So you can think of it as a kind of deformorphism that, uh, that is uh, smooth. So you can uh, you use the Dirichlet energy, for example, to define how close it is to a perfect translation. So you can measure some distance from uh, from your uh, translation group for them, or any other group and uh, uh, you can show that that uh, basically for small deformations the deviation from invariance or equivariance uh, will be will be small not every representation has this property for example Fourier doesn't so re regarding symmetry discovery I think that uh, probably the, the most generic model would be in this case uh, if you have some cloud of points in some high dimensional space would be uh, to, to to think of it as a graph and uh, try to discover some low dimensional structure. But uh, this is of course a far cry from uh, uh, the nice description of a group that in, my, in many cases might not, might not be available. So in, in general manifolds, you don't really have a, a group that, that let's say that, that acts uh, transitively as a you know, homogeneous spaces. So it might be uh, too simple a model uh, in general. Thanks a lot for this very interesting and insightful answers and also for the questions. I am sorry we have to continue to the next speaker because of our time constraints and I hand over to Claire. Hi, um, so excited to um, introduce Dr. Anastasia Varava, who I believe is here. Um, uh, she's currently a postdoc at KTH um, and gave a really cool talk uh, talking about different, a couple different projects. Um, on topological tools on complex manipulation. And her work is generally on geometric and topological applications to both ML and robotics. Um, so in the interest of time, we're gonna start off with a like offline question. And then as people like kind of gather their bearings, feel free to put it in the chat, raise your hand, and then we'll like gather questions from there. Um, but I'm gonna copy paste one offline question. 
which is um, in the first half of your talk, uh, you talked about computational complexity as a, a potential limitation. Um, but additionally, well, your input is a mesh representation of rigid objects. And are there lessons from that work that you think could be extended to other input representations, particularly noisier ones like point clouds, et cetera? Like there's some takeaways that you got from just these, not just uh, the, from the mesh representations that also applies to other, sort of, other forms of input. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for an interesting question. Uh, so in, um, uh, in, in the first work that I presented in my talk, the input is actually not uh, exactly, like the input to the algorithm is not exactly a mesh, but it's uh, an approximation of a mesh that is basically represented as a union of walls. And um, the complexity of that approximation uh, depends on kind of the computational resources that we have and also on the kind of level of uh, accuracy that we want our algorithm to have. Uh, and um, in the paper um, that I'm referring to in the talk, we actually show that uh, dependent on kind of the accuracy of this representation, uh, we'll get uh, stricter or kind of less strict provable guarantees on uh, Cajun past non existence. Um, so kind of like moving to noisier sensors and uh, point clouds. Uh, well, I generally believe in this kind of representation uh, as a union of both because it's really flexible. Uh, so you can do it starting from a point cloud. For example, you don't need a mesh. You can kind of bypass um, uh, the step of having a mesh uh, completely, I think. Uh, noise is, of course, a problem, uh, but I feel that it's, um, it's a bit of a different question. It's really uh, like not so much of a um, uh, question of past existence, but it's more of um, like really working with sensors and really like surface reconstruction kind of uh, stuff. So uh, I think it's doable. It was just uh, a bit beyond the scope of uh, the work. Cool. I'm going to do a quick scan for raised hands. And so I'm reading the chat, so I'm just going to follow up with a second offline question uh, before we move on. And I guess this one is about the second half of your talk, uh, the uh, Geom CA work. Um, so I'm pasting it in the chat, but um, ooh, the spacing is weird. But uh, so about the Geom CA work, can you expand a little bit on like, kind of an intuition for someone who's less familiar with this uh, this like area behind the the, the distinction between diversity of points and diversity of edges and how that looks in, in different uh, scenarios? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's also a good question. So um, the reason why we build edges, uh, like when we consider the graph of uh, basically uh, the, like um, proximity graph that consists of uh, both uh, sets, right? The one we want to kind of, the, the ground truth set and uh, our approximations, like the set that our generative model um, Kind of produced uh, the reason why we draw edges between um, like points of both types, so to say, like the fake one and the uh, real ones, uh, is because we want to kind of evaluate how uh, close the the two sets are to each other. So, like, so, so to say, how how much they overlap. Uh, like it's um, it's one thing to say that uh, we have the same kind of number of connected components, right? But we also want uh, the connected components of the true set and of the um, of the generated set uh, to really kind of um, be consistent. Uh, so that's basically the, the difference between the points and the edges. So the points is um, like, we analyze the points to basically answer the question of uh, how many connected components we have, uh, what is their size, uh, but the edges uh, we use basically to see how much they actually overlap and uh, how they're geometrically consistent. So not just like topologically. Cool. Thank you so much for the answer. <laughs> Very clean answer to uh, the question. Um, do we have anything else? Anybody else have a question? I have to do the like flippy thing where I go through all the <laughs> um, participants. Um, okay, I'm not seeing anything. So in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will also introduce uh, our next speaker, which is Professor Jeanette Bow, who is here because she asked a question earlier. Um, uh, her talk was on bridging topology and geometry in def uh, deformable object manipulation. Um, lots of cool ropes. Um, uh, I'm going to do the same thing. Well, I'll start off with an offline question because we have a couple, and then like feel free to put in the chat or raise your hand, um, and we'll follow through uh, with those. But um, so this first question is, I'll post, um, 
but uh, uh, for many applications of deformable object manipulation situations, you have more than one deformable object at a time. So at the start of your talk, you talk about like these like emergency scenarios where maybe you need to like stitch together a wound or you need to maybe put tie some things together. And um, uh, like it, you, you describe this set of possible states um, as like kind of like uh, a way to compose actions together as primitives um, when tying a knot. Um, but the, as you add more ropes into the potential knots you'd be making, this is going to grow a lot in, in computational complexity. Is this something that like was an immediate next thought uh, with your future work? Or is there uh, is that like more like a unexplored part of future work? Uh, yeah, I'm going to um, do the same as Alan, as Professor Alina Abushefa said, like, oh, this is still ongoing work. So yeah, uh, it's more, um, um, it's definitely going to be a challenge, like when, when you add more of these uh, deformable objects, like how you represent them in such a way um, um, that the complexity is kind of still manageable uh, of these approaches. Um, in terms of perception, uh, we showed some example actually where we can deal with it, where we can actually at least perceive these different ropes, but then how to plan over them and control them, that's going to be a challenge. And so we haven't, this is definitely a future work step, but it's not something we have explored that actually the more um, imminent question we are looking at is actually to go from ropes to um, other deformable objects that have like are more like 2D, like for example, claws, claws and things like that. But there we also have only considered yet one object of, of what to do with that one. But it's definitely an interesting direction. Um, but yeah, the challenge is gonna be the computational complexity and how to represent it. Yeah. Oh, you're muted actually now, I think, Claire. <laughs> Um, yeah. Thank you for the answer is basically what I was saying, but we also have a raised hand. So if you want to unmute yourself um, and ask your question. Yes, hi. Um, hi, Jeanette. Great, great hi. talk. And I, I was uh, excited to, um, to see how interesting you, you can handle those uh, flexible and flexible objects. And I asked myself the representation you had for the knots. Is it something which is standardly used in topology or you define for your specific problem? I, I know that not topology is a com complex uh, thing, right? And you have these standard representations of simplicial complexes whatsoever, right? CV complexes or, or so on. So the, the, the labeling you had, how, how did you get it? Is it standard in, in not theory? Yeah, we basically used knot theory and we adapted something called, I think, the P-data, like that was actually used in some uh, much older robotics work that kind of look, just looked at one uh, task. But yeah, we, we basically adopted, um, or let's say it was inspired by this older work. Uh, and then we looked for the similarities in order to do learning efficiently and to group these primitives together. Um, so that's where we got this from. Does it answer your question? But yeah, yeah, yeah it's it was actually um, when we so I um, uh, this is like the second work that I've done in uh, using actually topology. I had no experience in it before, so I wasn't even aware of the vast field of knot theory when we got started with it. So it was really exciting to see that kind of that part of the planning of this uh, higher level planning is actually in a way soft for us, and now we need to link it to the geometry of the rope. Uh, and uh, make it. Then, I'm sorry, robot. just to, just to make sure that I'm understanding. I thought these were literal Rademeister moves that you were using very cleverly. Yes. I thought. Is that right? So you, you're correct. you're you're embracing the whole that that whole uh, agenda. That's that was really very nice. I yeah, just wanted to make exactly. sure I understand. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, Alin was maybe more referring to that specific representation of uh, the topological state of. Um, uh, the current rope state basically to use that for as input to the policy. Um, yeah. Good. Thanks. Cool. I'll do a final pass for questions. Um, if if there aren't any in the interest of time, I will move on to the next speaker. But that was really cool. Um, Thank you. The talk. Um, okay. So. Um, and then our, uh, I believe our last invited speaker of this session is Professor Pavan Karaga from Arizona State University. Um, I have your video on my screen, so I know you're here. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and uh, he did a great talk on topological methods and modeling human activity, talking about all sorts of different kinds of sensor input and uh, using topological data analysis uh, techniques in order to interpret sensor data and a bunch of different applications. Um, uh, so I'll do the same pattern, except this time I'm going to put things in the chat so there's like space between, it's not just one big block of text. Um, uh, I'll start off with an offline question to kind of have people gather their, their stuff together, and then we'll follow up with questions for the audience. Um, so an offline question. Oh, did I hear something? Oh, it's just my mic turned on. Maybe you're oh. just hearing the noise. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so this is one question. A common thing with sensing, especially sensing humans, is the sheer breadth of sensor data available. By default, a lot of these different modalities are analyzed individually individually, and then their interactions reason about ad hoc at the end. Do you have any thoughts on using topological methods on more than one modality of robot sensing at once? Oof. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Claire, for the opportunity, and it's a great question. Uh, so indeed, it's, you know, I do know there is a sub-community within the topological data analysis community who are asking a related question. I haven't seen a great framework developed yet. Basically, you start with a metric space. I mean, topological data analysis, the beginnings is you have a metric space, you have a point cloud, you have a way to connect and create graphs, but what if the point cloud in the metric space is coming from two different sensing modalities? So there is this question of fusion. Should it happen at the stage of uh, at, the, at the stage of the sensor data itself that we find a way to fuse the sensor data to create a coherent metric space? Or should it happen parallelly in different metric spaces and then fusion happens at the level of the signatures? Uh, I mean, those are the classic fusion questions that have not been resolved forever. Uh, and it's it's not a, a TDA specific problem, right? I mean, even in the field of multimedia signal processing, the same thing uh, you know, is discussed, which is you have a scene, you have a camera, you have audio, you have you know, maybe other data, and then how do you reason about a scene? And even then, it's a fusion question fundamentally, not necessarily a TDA question, uh, but I do feel like there is a way in which um, we can consider a new way of framing uh, topological methods where uh, we allow for some middle ground uh, that it doesn't have to be fused at the sensor stage nor at the signature stage, but maybe there is a way in which we construct filtrations, which is informed by the modalities. I don't have a strong answer, but I do know that it's 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 a simmering problem <laughs> that uh, people are talking about. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we have one more offline question, but if anybody online has one now, feel free to jump in and interject or raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I will do the copy paste thing again. Um, So maybe I, I can fill the gap with a question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I uh, I did not make it yet to the end of your talk uh, until the, the start. But uh, you started with this example of the chaotic system and then pointing out to the difficulties with, which come up. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, did you identify motions for in, in biology and in human motion and so on, which indeed is, is uh, chaotic or? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's interesting that uh, uh, many people would think that human movement is not chaotic because I mean, the popular impression of chaos is things are shaky, but that's not the mathematical definition of things, right? So where does chaos appear in human movement? Uh, if you look at uh, a very specific example, such as a person standing still on a pressure platform, you would think there is no chaos there, but it is unbelievably chaotic. The, if you look at the trajectory of the center of mass of the person while they're standing still, it's clearly not static. There is a huge amount of shifts that are happening. There is uh, things that are constantly being balanced out and it is nothing but a chaotic system. And of course you can even quantify the levels of chaos. And there is a history of using chaos kind of descriptors and Lyapunov exponents types of descriptors to measure balance. and. Uh, check whether uh, you are at risk of a fall and uh, those kinds of things. So chaos exists in human movement, maybe not in the way we think. Maybe, so one is, uh, if you look at gross movement, you know, full body movement, walking from left to right, 
would that be considered a chaotic system? The system itself, uh, I mean, the, the, the signals itself will not exhibit chaos as much as if you change how you measure it. So if you put a wearable uh, on the wrist versus the chest versus the hip, and then you look at the signals, then again, you will observe chaos because it's the same movement being measured by three different sensors at three different locations of the body. Uh, you, do, you don't want to call it chaos in the popular notion of the term, but it's nonlinear dynamics with a different measurement operator and the signals will look dramatically different. So if that is, uh, that's the way I call it chaos, which is human movement is a dynamical system. It's nonlinearly coupled dynamical system. But then if you change the way you measure data from even simple movements, the variability is extremely high. And uh, the way you explain that variability is through the chaos framing. And then of course, there is uh, this other special things, which is very minute movements, uh, which are very hard to sense by gross sensors. Uh, there, there is chaos of its own kind. You know, we are constantly balancing out different forces in the body and the environment to stay stable and things like that. So there is chaos at different levels, I'd say. But it's really chaos in the sense of having different attractors. And I mean, not, not every movement which looks weird when you look at the signals need to exhibit chaotic properties, right? You mentioned the layout of exponents and so on. They might be only complex, but still have some they might other have, properties right. than, than, than chaotic, right? Being some limit cycles right. or whatever at the end. Right. I mean, by and large, I do agree that yes, there is nonlinearity, but when you look at the attractors for most common actions, they do seem to have a single attractor. Uh, bifurcations and shifting to a different mode does happen, but in special cases, like if you're about to fall or yes, you will shift to a different uh, phase space and I mean, I mean, different part in the phase space. So these two things, these things do happen. Uh, when it comes to uh, gross movement, if you think of conjunctions of simple activities, like if you're walking and then suddenly you decided to jump and then you're measuring that, that with a sensor, then again, you will see shifts to a different uh, part of the phase space. And that would be, again, long range activities could be seen as shifting through uh, different parts of the phase space. In the past, people have used things like switching dynamical systems to explain that behavior, but that assumes uh, you have to have parametric forms for each of the simple components. Uh, when you go past the parametric forms approach, then you can certainly think of it as a, a, a very complex chaotic system, which is shifting between attractors. Uh, we haven't done, uh, we haven't fully done uh, that framing yet, but we actually do have some belief that uh, we have data from 24 seven recordings of IMUs uh, of people just wearing like a Fitbit and living their lives for you know weeks at a time. When you look at that raw signal stream, I look at it and I feel, oh man, this is again, this is looking like chaos because it's going from just by looking at the raw signal stream. So we haven't yet applied uh, these methods to 24 seven recordings for weeks on end, uh, but it's a good question that is actually bringing all these ideas to my head right now. Maybe we should, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we're running right up on time and we have quite a few like poster talks to go through. Um, so that'll be our next session and then we'll finish with the panel and then the award and closing remarks. Um, so I'm going to share screen and let me know like verbally because I won't be able to see the chat if nobody can hear. So maybe just for the organization part, we're gonna stream first four talks in a batch and then we have a q a for those four um, spotlights and then we're going to stream three spotlights and again a q a for that so feel free to put uh, your question in the chat during the streaming hi hi welcome to this short video of our recent work on current design for the and analytical research i want to briefly present the main idea of our approach and share some preliminary results that we obtained over the last weeks before I begin, I want to thank my collaborators Leon and Rozzo and Melanie Zeitner. In this paper, we assume that a robot's behavior is imposed by a Gaussian Hessler model. The data to construct, construct such a model can be obtained from kinesthetic demonstration. However, the resulting policies are oftentimes suboptimal and require refinement. Our goal is now to employ Bayesian optimization, or BO for short, to refine the policy. A key idea of BO is to approximate the objective function via a Gaussian process a kernel-based regression technique. And this raises the question, 
what is actually a suitable kernel function for GMMs? Or in the case of stationary kernel functions, how do we properly compute the distance between GMMs? The distance between GMMs, we make use of the fact that any inner product space induces a norm, which in turn can be used to compute distances. Since the inner product between PDFs of GMMs have a closed form solution, we can define the distance in a straightforward manner. Additionally, we propose to include so-called length scale parameters. They will allow us to infer the respective relevance of each of its check components. So let's compare our approach with other methods. While efficient to compute and easy to implement, the Euclidean distance does not consider the underlying geometry of the spaces of GBMMs. One can easily construct examples where the Euclidean distance fails, as we demonstrate in our extended abstract. The KL divergence properly considers the geometry. However, there is no closed form solution for GMMs, but only an approximation to it. Also, the Wasserstein distance does not have a closed form solution for GMMs, but requires to solve a non-trivial optimization problem, which is infeasible for our purpose. In comparison, our method is aware of the parameter spaces geometry, has a closed form solution and guarantees a valid kernel because the metric is norm induced. Let's have a look at some preliminary results. We first consider the positive definiteness of the kernel, a key property for the numerical stability of Gaussian processes. To this end, we sample 20 random Gaussian mixture models and compute the gram matrix. The minimum eigenvalue of said matrix is an indicator for the definiteness. We see that for both KL-based approaches, the eigenvalues can become negative for certain length scales, whereas our method always retains the positive definiteness. Next, we investigate the automatic relevance determination. We simulate a two-dimensional robot whose goal is it to track a C-shaped trajectory with its end effector. The policy is encoded with a GMM of three components, and we sample different policies and evaluate two ob uh, different objectives. One that captures if the robot joint configuration approaches similarities, and the other me uh, that measures the distance of the end effector to a target position. The benefit of these objectives is that we can intuitively answer the question which of the components is most relevant. For the first objective, it is the second component where the end effector is farthest from the robot space, and the second objective is clearly governed by the last component. And when inferring the length scale parameters by maximizing the log likelihood of the Gaussian process, we can readily identify the most relevant parameters indicated by the small length scale parameters. The next steps for our research are now to close the policy optimization loop and actually apply Bayesian optimization. And here we are especially interested in how different parameters, meaning the, the mean and covariance parameters of the GMM, affect the quality of different metrics. Thank you for your attention and please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or any remarks. Thanks. I'm Sandesh Adhikari, and I'm presenting our abstract for sampling over Riemannian manifolds with kernel herding, joint work with Josie Thompson and Byron Boots. Kernel herding is a deterministic sampling algorithm used to draw samples from probability distributions, given their kernel mean embeddings, which are representations of distributions as points in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, corresponding to the expected kernel function over samples from that distribution. We can also compute empirical kernel mean embeddings for a set of samples here x tilde with weights w. When generating the tf herded sample, we solve the following optimization problem, which in practice tends to generate samples that converge to the target distribution faster than IID sampling from the true distribution itself. Implementations of kernel herding have thus far been restricted to Euclidean data spaces. We propose two intuitive modifications to adapt it to Riemannian manifolds that arise frequently in robotics. We inject geometric information by picking kernels that incorporate the curvature of the manifold and use Riemannian optimization to constrain generated samples on the manifold. In our experiments, we use variants of Riemannian gradient descent and geodesic Laplacian kernels for which we empirically compute threshold bandwidths beyond which they are positive definite. A similar strategy was recently successfully used in adapting Bayesian optimization to Riemannian manifolds. We note that kernel herding is a central component of many other algorithms designed for various problems important in robotics, including filtering, simulator parameter estimation, and likelihood-free Bayesian inference. Thus, adapting kernel herding to Riemannian manifolds allows us to do the same for algorithms designed for many useful tasks. We evaluate our approach on two such tasks. First, we consider drawing resamples from a set of weighted particles, as is done in particle filters. We generate target empirical distributions on the SO3 and S3 manifolds, both of which can be used to encode rotations. We compare Riemannian kernel herding against standard Euclidean kernel herding with heuristic projections onto the manifold, as well as a recently proposed resampling approach 
here called OT, that computes an optimal transport map to the empirical distribution formed, formed by first applying sampling, importance, resampling. We find that Riemannian kernel herding produces higher quality resamples with lower errors than the alternatives for both manifolds considered. Moreover, we demonstrate how Riemannian kernel herding can be used to adapt other algorithms to Riemannian manifolds, namely the kernel recursive approximate Bayesian computation, KRABC algorithm, which uses kernel herding to estimate parameters of simulators. We experiment with two simulators with symmetric positive definite matrices. First, we estimate the covariance matrix of a three-dimensional Gaussian and find that Riemannian KRABC orange outperforms all alternatives with simulation errors close to that for the true distribution itself. Here, we've also included kernel herding using a Shalesky decomposition parameterization shown in yellow. Finally, we estimate the three by three inertia matrix of the palm of an adroit robot hand simulator. The, the observations here were the trajectories of angular positions of the hand's two wrist joints under a sequence of fixed controls. As before, we find that Riemannian KREBC outperforms the alternatives with the difference being higher for fewer herded samples. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be with you for today's event. My name is Sam Jeffrey Jan. I'm from Department of Engineering and Natural Sciences from Tampere University in Finland. Beside the other colleagues, I have the honor to be presenting you this work, which is the Natural Gradient Boosting Collision Detection in Robot Manipulators. We shall start with the problem definition. With increasing demands for higher production rates and with the economical aspirations, there is a momentum forming in obtaining autonomous solutions. However, a main barrier to reach this objective is the demand for manual operations and programming the robots on the factory side. This problem imposes a human factor risk and decreases the production rate, especially when there is a need for maintenance on the factory side. A bottleneck that causes an obstacle to obtain autonomous solutions is originating from collision checking process and real-time planners. This problem becomes more explicit, especially for complex environments, such as what is illustrated here. The major problem is originating from the geometrical and topological assumptions for the environment and robot manipulator. As a matter of fact, the computation time is directly linked to the type of geometrical assumptions and also the number of updates required to, to get the positions, which is the location and orientations of the collision geometries, both for the robot manipulator and also for the objects of the environment. In this regard, since the operations of the robot in industry is usually conducted in round space rather than using the inverse kinematic operation, we are encouraged to utilize a learning-based approach to accelerate the collision checking process. In this work, we are utilizing a natural gradient boosting technique, which is a learning-based model capable of estimating the underlying relations and calculations of a collision checking process. By generating enough samples, we are able to estimate the collision state space. With the obtained model, we will infer whether the new configurations are in collision states or not. The information of the collision will be later utilized by the autonomous pass planners for generating collision free pass. The advantage of this technique is by passing the computation required to obtain the collision state. This is especially regarding the collision checking process that requires a couple of tests for inferring whether a collision happening or not between the robot or the environment. To validate the model, we have utilized a UR5 robot manipulator. We have generated 300,000 configuration labels for training and testing purpose. With an acceptable quality of training, the model is capable of enhancing the inference time to an improvement of approximately 1,000 times. With the enhanced model at hand, we can conclude to the future works with the following manifold. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be available for further questions. Hello, everyone. My name is Ritiman, and on behalf of all the authors, it is a pleasure to present our paper Dynamic Bimanual Reactive Motion Planning Using Predictive Multi-Agents. Consider a scenario like this, as shown in this picture, where the robot must plan a trajectory along an unstructured environment with multiple obstacles while satisfying the tightly coupled kinematic and task-based constraints. Example, 
carrying this tray with a cup of water. Our goal is to explore the environment by spawning multiple circular field agents, that is, each operating like a dynamical system with an attractive and obstacle avoidance force, so that the robot is able to plan paths to goal even in complex scenarios like such as this. Therefore, as you can see in this picture, during a planning step, multiple agents are spawned with different dynamical parameters resulting in different trajectories around the obstacle. We then evaluate each agent after a certain number of steps into the future and then select the best one according to some cost function. The trajectory of this agent is then tracked by the lower level multi-priority controller through the absolute pose. The key idea in our cooperative set-based task priority framework is to explore interesting geometric task primitives in spin 3 cross R3 and flexibly control them by utilizing the null space of the system. Primitives can be defined as geometrical constructs such as points, lines, twists and wrenches, all of which can be expressed using dual quaternion algebra. For example, if we want to control the distance of the circular field-based funnel, which is essentially controlling one degree of freedom, we define the subset RD and construct the corresponding Jacobian JD. We may also want to control the tilt of the end effector, which is essentially controlling the deviation of the z-axis so that the cup doesn't topple over during the motion. So we wanted to chill and relax a bit by watching the Euro Cup final with the beer delivered by the robot. So he had to start planning by spawning multiple agents and then using the multi-priority controller with four tasks, the relative pose, the absolute pose, the end effector tilt and joint limit avoidance. Switching was performed on the order of these tasks based on the activation and deactivation according to the criteria. And yes, that was indeed very satisfying. We can also control the end effector tilt. And as you can see, we command the tray to be at an angle of 30 degrees throughout the motion. Of course, the other tasks are also present and are being controlled throughout this trajectory. Furthermore, we also show how our system swiftly reacts to dynamic obstacles coming in its way. The basic idea is to have the virtual current element around the obstacles and have the force. Of course, at present we do not have any vision feedback going into the planner, so we simulate the obstacle position and velocity, as you can see in this video. Thank you. So that was the last of our first four talk batch. Um, Noemi, can you share the, the speakers? And then Chris, you can uh, handle questions. Uh, sure. So for the first one, um, uh, kernel design for Ga Gaussian mixture models in direct policy certs. Questions from the audience? Yes, I can quickly answer that. So that was from uh, Noemi, I think. Um, and yes, so you were asking like what additional components I need for uh, actually like closing the, the loop for, for direct policy search. And in fact, we, we actually like we, we have all the components that we need. We actually tried this uh, for a couple of uh, different objectives. And what we observed is that well, actually most of the objectives mo depend strongly only on the mean components of this GMM. And if only the mean components are kind of relevant, our distance behaves very much the same as the Euclidean distance. So there's actually no, not really like a benefit um, of using like our distance compared to Euclidean, uh, but only for the objectives that we have um, tested so far. So our goal, like one immediate goal is now to, to kind of find objectives, which also depends on the covariance matrices um, to, and that we hope we actually like, see further benefits and another issue is that, um, especially with the GMMs, like the parameter space increases very uh, quickly. So if we, let's say, have like four uh, mixture components in, in, in four dimensions where we already have like, uh, like 20 or like 30 parameters, which is kind of like hard to handle for BO. So that's also like kind of an issue that we are currently struggling with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, Maybe Hadi has raised hand, so feel free to unmute. Do you hear me now? Because I had some problem. Okay, great. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed this point or not. I just want to ask, um, how do you impose external conditions like dynamic obstacle avoidance in your method? Um, I might have missed this point from your approach. 
like in general, how do you, how do you impose, for example, in real time, how do you avoid obstacles given the position of the obstacle? From Lucas. Oh, sorry, that was for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh i'm not exactly sure what, what do you mean like how to avoid the the obstacles uh like if if i uh if i change the mean parameters for example and of, of the mixture components or yeah what i what i understood as you're trying to lend like set of means and this is like gmm from set of demonstrations that you have right yeah yeah exactly and then, and then you land this gmm and then once you once you have like this gmm you can actually like produce these new trajectories Yes, and, yes, exactly. Uh, so my question would be: so during the execution, there would be obstacles that you haven't, uh, you don't consider it during the demonstration, right? So the obstacles mm -hmm. come the, like in, in the runtime. How how do you um, take into account these obstacles? So that would be my question during the execution. Is there any way, or do you do it, or um, it's just a general okay, so, question? Okay, so currently we are not considering this. So this is not kind of the focus of, of, of this work. I see. Um, I'm, I'm quite certain <clears throat> there are other lines of research actually dealing with that, like this uh, dynamic obstacle avoidance. Um, it's not currently our scope, but it actually might be very interesting to uh, include this actually in like some way of like constrained Bayesian optimization. I know that's the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and to combine this might actually Cool idea, thanks. Um, and another question very quickly. So you showed that you're using two degrees of freedom robot, right? Um, was it two or three? I'm not sure. So was there a reason to use um, this, this small degrees of freedom instead of uh, going with uh, uh, like a redundant robot, like uh, seven degrees of freedom or something? <clears throat> so um, for, for our preliminary experiments, we just use this very simple robot. Because as I already said, like in the answer to Anomi's question, like the dimensionality of parameter space quickly becomes a problem. So this is why we kind of like scaled everything down. Um, mm -hmm. And this is also like um, for, for what I just presented the results here. But just the inference of the length scales and everything that, that kind of that works well also in higher dimensional spaces. And this also works. We've tried this in simulation on a, for example, on a, a KUKA robot and that works just as well. Okay, I see. Thank you for your answers. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next talk uh, by Sandesh. I think there's a question by Noemi. Noemi, do you want to ask this question? Yeah, I can ask it directly online. Um, so yeah, the question was, um, in, in your talk, if I understood properly, you're using um, geodesic distance-based um, kernels. Um, so it is kind of well known that the validity of this kernel is, is limited um, to some spaces that are usually isometric to Euclidean spaces. So I was wondering if you considered uh, using some kind of mathematically well-defined, if I can say it like that, uh, kernels, such as the ones that were presented in a paper by um, Alexander and, and Slava, um, that also presented that in the talk, in their talk in this workshop. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's definitely true. And uh, that's going to be one of the things we're going to look into is moving beyond these geodesic uh, cur exponential kernels and then trying some of these other kernels that don't have this issue of positive definiteness and other uh, issues that don't make them valid. Uh, right now, uh, we began with these geodesic kernels I, uh, for two reasons. The first one was uh, one metric that ends up being important for kernel herding in particular is if the kernel is also characteristic. And uh, there were, there has like, at least in Euclidean space, we know that Gaussian and Laplacian kernels are characteristic. So that was one of the initial reasons, like once, if we can get this to work, uh, the next step would be to start identifying whether or not the same characteristicness we can like carry over to other non-Euclidean spaces. Uh, second, uh, we ended up finding that uh, at least for the manifolds we were working with, there was Usually the uh, spherical manifold ended up becoming very useful, like even for SVD uh, matrices, you could like figure out a way to uh, represent them with qu quaternion uh, rotations. So uh, at least for the spherical case, uh, the Laplacian kernel ended up being valid for like all bandwidth. So uh, that was one of the reasons we gravitated towards the uh, geodesic kernels, but definitely, yeah, I think next step would be to try to see how well this would uh, work with like other more uh, mathematically sound uh, kernels. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think let's move on. There's a question for uh, Hesam. Um, 
what's the features you use for your network? How are you encoding environments? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, we we have actually used the 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 robots and also the environment collision geometries for uh, for getting the uh, uh, features and also uh, uh, the distributions of the uh, samples in in the in the robots joints. So the we uniformly random uh, and randomly will will sample the the joints and then utilize these uh, these information for uh, getting the collision state. Thank you. Uh, did that cover Gao? Is, is Gao here? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions for Hassan? Uh, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, the we have utilized the physics engines for for getting the uh, the data. Uh, the the current speed for for checking a complex environment is around like six hundred uh, samples uh, um, using the physics engine. But when you uh, uh, estimate using a neural network or a learning based technique, uh, the speed will uh, will increase to nine hundred thousand uh, checks per per minute. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Ridi Man. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I see a raised hand by Vasilis. Uh, go ahead, Vasilis. Yeah. Um, thank you. Great work. Um, I guess one question I had is uh, so you <clears throat> you basically try to simulate forward, uh, you know, different trajectories, different outcomes, basically, and picking the best one. Uh, yeah. Would it be possible to do that, uh, like in the case of dynamic obstacles, and also, uh, I guess, somewhat a separate question: Have you considered merging all this process into one particular policy, one particular vector field, for example? Um, so, so the first question, uh, yes. Uh, also, in dynamic obstacles, uh, this can be parallelized the agents. So, we are not actually doing. Um, uh, I think this is a bit different from the slide that I showed. We're not actually doing a, a complete plan from start to finish, but going a look ahead fashion. So basically taking, I don't know, 50 steps forward and having multiple trajectories. And then uh, in the meanwhile, the robot catches up and we do the next episode and this, like this, it continues till the end. So you so don't need to know have... the exact model, for example, of the dynamic. No, model. yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so, sorry, I forgot the second question. What yeah, so the second question is uh, whether it would be possible to merge all this process, the, all this search process into one single policy, for example. Um, this is a good question, but uh, so actually we kind of want to have these different vector fields because each of the different fields will result in different kind of paths around the obstacle. So basically, if you want to avoid the obstacle in a certain fashion, maybe from the top or towards from the side or towards the left, uh, this will help. But in the end, um, we actually haven't uh, thought of merging all of them together so far. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, the motivation behind my question was mostly if you, like if you can get uh, computational advantages, if you, if, uh, you know, if you can avoid uh, searching all the possible outcomes, uh, but yeah, uh, that, that makes sense. And from your paper, I saw that uh, this is not an issue in your implementation, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, thanks. Uh, any other questions from the audience for demand? All right, just if not, let's oh, sure. just move on to the next box. Yeah, Claire, take it away. Hello everyone, my name is Riddhiman and on behalf of all the authors, it is a pleasure to present our paper User Guided Motion Planning in Spin 3 cross R3 using screw linear interpolation. Consider these tasks of fluid transfer, pouring and stacking, all of which require satisfaction of translation or orientation constraints along the trajectory from start to finish. Therefore, 
In this work, we explore a single kinesthetic demonstration, which we provide as input, as you can see in this top panel here, and we want to find a path from an initial pose to the new task instance, which is essentially a set of joint positions which makes the end effector move along this desired path. We use crew linear interpolation as a local planner to generate smooth motion between two transformations represented by unit dual quaternions, which is the rigid body representation that we use in this work and helps us perform the interpolation efficiently. Slurp has the nice and crucial property of being invariant to the choice of the reference frames because as you can see in these two pictures on the right, if we fix frames A and B on the two corners of the object, a linear interpolation in the parameter space results in displaced in between poses. So, in a nutshell, we provide the kinesthetic demonstration, have another task instance which we want to accomplish at a new location in the workspace, which may also be at a different height, we compute the imitated path and then use repeated screw linear interpolations and differential inverse kinematics to compute the final path. Intuitively speaking, the goal is to find a path that blends into it, the imitated path as you can see in this picture. We now present some experimental results. We have the pouring task on the top followed by the stacking task. The blue marker here denotes the position in the workspace where the demonstration is provided. In the middle here, we can see different new instances of the task being computed and executed using this single demonstration and our algorithm. The graph here shows the different end effector frames during the motion. So this is the demonstration that I show here, and this is the computed path for trial two. As you can see, orientation constraints are maintained throughout the trajectory. Here is a stacking task, which we also perform using our algorithm, and this is the graph for the stacking task. This experiment demonstrates the fact that from a single demonstrated motion, our algorithm is successful in planning multiple trajectories with new initial and final configurations for moving multiple boxes. To summarize, our goal is to propose a method for task-specific motion planning. An important point to note here is that parameterizations of AC3, like homogeneous transformation matrices, do not ensure constraint satisfaction trivially in our setting. We present the notion of imitation in the task space. Our planner combines CLRP with human demonstrations to generate motions which satisfy task space constraints. Hi, thank you for your interest in our paper, Discontinuous Trajectory Learning with Topological Data Analysis. Optimal control is hard to solve due to non convexity, and learning from optimal trajectories can help to solve them more efficiently and reliably. It parameterizes the problem and approximates the mapping to the optimal trajectories using pre computed data. This mapping is usually discontinuous and hard to be approximated by continuous models like neural networks. Our approach is to cluster the data so that the mapping is continuous in each partition of the domain. The contribution of this work is we show the topology of the domain and graph of a function can be used to check discontinuity, cluster the data, and improve learning. This can be done by comparing the first two Betty numbers of x and x and z. The two Betty numbers are the number of connected components and one-dimensional holes, as shown in this figure. The first case is B0 of x is smaller than B0 of z, like this figure, which is parameterized by the vertical position of the start and has discontinuity when crossing the red bar. For this type of discontinuity, connected component analysis in z clusters the dataset. The second case is B1 of x greater than B1 of z, like this example. The domain has a hole whereas the graph doesn't. This continuity occurs on the right side when crossing the red line. We use recursive normalized cut to cluster the data set. The left figure shows a problem with nine obstacles. This continuity occurs at the top right corner of each obstacle. The clusters are shown on the right where each color denotes the stars of one cluster. Within each cluster, this continuity doesn't exist. This table shows the average constraint violation of the trend model and our approach gets the lowest violation with fewer clusters. The third case is B1 of x is smaller than B1 of z, like this figure. The domain is the plane and the trajectories form a 1D hole, as shown by the red trajectories. One strategy is to split the graph into sector-like shapes 
like this figure. Our approach generalizes this idea to higher dimensions. We test on a problem with non-stationary obstacles, and the results are shown in this table. Our approach achieves the best average constraint violation and the minimum maximum violation, showing its reliability near singularity. In conclusion, our study shows the topology of a function's domain and graph can help to determine the discontinuity type and how to cluster the Hi, my name is David Rosen, and today I'll be introducing some of our recent work on the Ramanian geometry of synchronization solutions. So the group synchronization problem entails estimating the value of a set of n unknown group elements in a Lie group G, given noisy measurements of a subset of their pairwise ratios xi inverse xj. Uh, so this problem is typically formulated as an m estimation problem over a graph, and it appears ubiquitously uh, throughout geometric estimation applications. Uh, so for example, in robotics, the fundamental problem of pose graph slam, which is our application of interest, is exactly the problem of synchronization over the special Euclidean group. And so developing robust and efficient methods for solving synchronization problems is of significant practical importance. So a well-known feature of synchronization problems is that these always exhibit a global symmetry. So to see that, uh, let's take any vector of n group elements, x, and consider the effect of left multiplying each of these elements by a common uh, group element, g. So in the case of pose graph slam, that would correspond to applying a single rigid transformation to each of the poses appearing in a pose graph. Well, it's pretty easy to see uh, that both of these vectors actually have a common set of pairwise ratios. And since these pairwise ratios are the only things that actually enter the synchronization objective, uh, both x and its transformed version gx are actually indistinguishable as solutions of the synchronization problem. So the effect of this symmetry is to partition the state space into equivalence classes of points that are related by symmetry and that are indistinguishable as synchronization solutions. And so in particular, this means that synchronization solutions are never unique. And this non-uniqueness has several uh, negative consequences. So statistically, it implies that synchronization is non-identifiable since we can't actually distinguish points that belong to the same orbit. And computationally, the fact that solutions are not isolated means that the standard regularity conditions that ensure the good behavior of optimization methods are in fact never satisfied for synchronization problems. So the main idea behind this work is to show how one can account for symmetry by constructing what is called a classifying space for the set of synchronization solutions. And so uh, the main idea behind this is to build a space Q out of our original space G by collapsing each set of equivalent solutions down to a single point. And formally we do this using what is called a quotient construction. And so the payoff for doing this is that the points of the classifying space Q are then in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of fundamentally different synchronization solutions. And so in particular, this construction has the effect of eliminating the symmetry that is present in the original solution space GN. So in this work, we prove that Q is always a smooth manifold and can be equipped with a Ramanian metric that is induced from a left invariant metric on the base group G. And we derive closed form formulas for the manifold operations on Q, such as the exponential moderate of the map, uh, in terms of those on the base group G itself. And so in terms of payoffs, uh, statistically, Q then provides a natural uh, symmetry where setting for the analysis of synchronization estimation algorithms. Uh, and computationally, uh, we can reduce the synchronization problem to an equivalent but regular M estimation that is defined directly on Q. And this in turn enables fast inference via Ramanian optimization directly on the classifying space itself. So thanks for your attention, and I'd be very happy to discuss all of this in more detail in the live session. So that was our batch of three talks. Um, let's start with, does anybody have questions for the first talk? Use your guided motion playing and spin three or three using screw linear interpolation. Uh, I think that there is a question in the chat. Oh, is there? Yes, I have asked the question. So oh, cool. maybe rephrase, rephrase it here. I noticed in your examples that the, either the translation component or the rotation component were rather stationary during the motions. And so I wondered whether uh, the same strategy would work for motions, but this is not the case. Uh, so you mean because when I'm kind of pouring the, 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 the translation is fixed while the orientation is changing. And when I'm moving, it's the other way around. So uh, and this, uh, this uh, slurp interpolation this sort, sort of preserves this into exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that is what I'm using uh, for, for the new path. But if, if this is, for example, if I, if I go from, from uh, start to end, 
not translating and then pouring, but in a different way, would this also produce something reasonable or not? I think so, because all these constraints are implicitly kind of contained in the demonstrations. And I'm kind of exploiting uh, Sclerp to actually have these in the re being reflected in the new path that I'm computing at the new uh, location. So, and also it depends where I'm blending in the path, right? The immediate trajectory that I create. For, for now that you see, it's basically towards the end. So you can actually, this is another part that you're kind of exploring now where you want to blend in so that you capture those specific constraints and you can do segmentation also of the trajectory to kind of know what you want and extract constraints and then have those constraints in the final part. Mm -hmm. So Thank does you. this kind of answer your question? Or? Yes. Yeah. And you also had another question, I think, uh, why dual quaternions? Yes. Um, I think, uh, so I think the biggest advantage is kind of because we are doing um, rigid body interpolation, dual quaternion kind of uh, preserves both the translation and orientations and we get like uh, unique in between poses. If you decouple them, which is often usually the design choice and people do them, it doesn't result in unique poses in between as I show. So you probably get something which is kind of displaced in between, which you probably don't want in constraint motion plans. Uh, and the second thing is basically, uh, you have a, a lot of advantages with computation because it's a bit faster than using 16 numbers. Um, and yeah. I guess that's the main advantage in, in many practical applications, yeah. Yeah. It's a very low dimensional representation of AC3. Yeah. Okay, we have a raised hand. Yeah. Wanna... Yeah. <laughs> so my question is actually kind of related. You mentioned that you're using the features that they are somehow inherent in the demonstrations, right? Yeah. So what, what about the external features? Like what about, for example, something like obstacle avoidance? Do you also consider that during planning or this is something that you don't have it yet? So right now there's no obstacle avoidance in this mm -hmm. framework, but um, we are kind of uh, thinking about introducing that. Uh, and of course, I mean, uh, you have, of course you have to maintain the, the orientation constraints as well when you do obstacle avoidance. So um, right now it's not there, uh, but yeah, it's it's a, it's a, a future work. So that's good. Yeah, I just want to know if you already have something. Great, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool, moving on. Does anybody have questions for Gao? Uh, maybe I can ask. <clears throat> I, I, I like the use of uh, uh, this homological perspective in this uh, paper uh, to do, do to, to do clustering, and I saw that <clears throat> your method indeed outperformed uh, k-means baselines using fewer clusters. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, moving forward, what are some limitations that you noticed through the use of such methodologies in this domain? I think it's something that I haven't seen much, and I I'm deeply appreciative, but I would like uh, to hear from you. What are some of the limitations that you noticed and what are some of the things uh, that you'd like to tell people to keep in mind uh, when they go about using such techniques for robotics problems? Maybe it's a very vague question, but I just want to hear your perspective uh, on basically using TDA for this particular domain. Oh, yes. Yeah. So thanks for the question and thanks for reading my paper. Yeah. So, so basically, I think um, right now, so if, if the problem was like, uh, you're mapping from one component to multiple components. So I think this problem can be considered as soft um, because, it, um, because first of all, computing connected components is, is relatively straightforward. Second, like mm -hmm. if you have the structure, then the function you're gonna learn will not be too complex. But what I'm worried about is that when you, when you raise the, the, the dimensionality of your holes, such as when you're dealing with 1D holes, then I find that it's quite difficult um, First of, all, first of all, and to have sufficient coverage coverage of data to, to compute the host. 
Second is like to mm -hmm. get some intuition of how how you should cluster the data. Uh, furthermore, if you want, to, if we, you want to further increase the dimension of your herd, such as for like a two dimensional herd, then I feel like currently most numerical methods to compute those uh, those topological topological features either requires lots either requires lots of data uh, or it requires right. lots of time. Yeah, and, and even even if you have those. Uh, I don't, I think it's hard to find some intuition of how you should really cluster this data. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any questions for David? We're running quite a little over time, so. Maybe I can ask something here. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I got everything from your talk. So maybe this is a bit, um, yeah, dumb almost. But um, I, I wonder, based on the mathematical framework that you developed, um, kind of what is left to do in order to apply it to the application that you mentioned at the beginning, like um, motion planning and all, all this. Yeah, uh, so yeah, sorry about that. I that went kind of fast. It was like a two or three minute video. I should say, like, thanks to everyone else for putting on like, a, a great event. This is super, super cool stuff. So I'm really happy to be, uh, to be present with you. Um, so, in terms of what's left to apply, um, uh, there's actually, so the kind of the point of that was just to show that uh, you can actually get everything that you need to solve that problem over the classifying space entirely in terms of data that already is described by the base group G that you build your problem out of. And so uh, kind of the point was actually just literally to be a recipe for exactly building those optimization and inference methods uh, just based on the description of the group. And typically you have access to those basic operations on the group in closed form, like we know what the geodesics of. Uh, like the rotation group or for instance, or uh, the special Euclidean group. Um, I, didn't, I unfortunately just didn't have time to put some of that stuff in the videos just because I only had two pages in like three minutes. But, uh, but that's sort of the obvious next step is just to literally just implement that like at the level of code and stuff and uh, just run some experiments. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Cool. Thank you so much to all of our, um, our speakers in this back. Um, we're going to move on to the the afternoon panel discussion. Um, so we're gonna invite back our, our invited speakers. Um, this went relatively well this morning with a very small starter. So I'll start again with like a very general question. Um, of course, like everyone is welcome to like to build a community where everyone is welcome to unmute and ask questions and discuss what they think about these things. Um, but uh, a big part, a big goal of this workshop is to um, kind of figure out as a community where we want to go next. So our starter question is going to be like, what do you think are the next challenges for geometric and topological methods in robotics? Um, if anyone has an opinion, <laughs> just go ahead and unmute and say something. Um, I could start with a thing that's like not necessarily like, uh, this is just something that I think it could be important, uh, which is related to uh, Professor Allen's question earlier about how can we really identify the geometric structure that persists in the robotics problem rather than really kind of define them and how to really say like learn those structures from data. I think that's one important question that we can think about. Yeah, I can second this uh, this opinion. I think this is well. Uh, maybe I'm less familiar with robotics questions, but I think in geometric machine learning, this is one of the, the uh, key next steps: how to discover a structure from data. Am I so old that everyone is professoring me? I have to color my hair or something. Uh, just just stop doing that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess like an extension of that question is if we're thinking about robotics and machine learning as well, um, like what, what, what do these areas currently lack in order to exploit more geometric and topological methods as is? 
Like, is there missing infrastructure? Is there something that just makes it just that much more difficult that we were not like gapping those bridges, bridging those gaps the way that we'd like? So maybe I can start, I can express an opinion uh, again in uh, what is happening in the deep learning community that, uh, first of all, so, so there are several things. So one of them, uh, which is uh, important to uh, take into account is the hardware. And somehow uh, what happened is uh, a marriage of certain approaches with certain type of hardware that uh, neither the algorithms are necessarily the optimal for certain tasks, nor the hardware is optimal for uh, for these algorithms. But uh, 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 specifically, let's say, talking about CNNs and, 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 uh, and GPUs, but uh, the combination worked and it was very efficient. And uh, the, the trend in the, somehow in the field was to uh, compensate for lack of understanding of the problem and lack of, let's say, even hardware the invariance by uh, data augmentation. So just throw more data and uh, you have enough compute power to, to address it. Uh, and it works to some extent. And uh, in some applications, indeed, you have almost uh, unlimited amount of data, but in some others, you don't. So I think now uh, there is uh, maybe a little bit of departure from this uh, from this trend and um, going back to, to the roots and better understanding the, the problem. And the, the question of hardware is really important because some of the, the architectures, let's say the, the more modern architectures, like let's say graph neural networks are not necessarily friendly for existing hardware. So uh, I know that several uh, semiconductor companies are looking into um, these uh, uh, basically what, what will be the next generation of, of silicon that, that uh, will be able to, to, uh, to be more compatible with the, these kind of architectures with the usual caveat of course that it takes about five years to develop a new chip and by this time by machine uh, learning standards this is uh, almost uh, eons so by this time the algorithms that exist today will possibly become already obsolete I guess a question to all of our panelists, somewhat related is like in when you when picking and deciding which geometric and topological methods to use, sometimes there's this like intuitive feeling of like this is the right place to use this tool for this problem. Is there something that you've learned through your own research in the last like n years, months, whatever, um, on on how to build that intuition or like what what is your like taste and flavor in terms of how you find the right tool to solve the right problem? That's a hard question. I know, <laughs> but <laughs> well, I mean, I, please, go ahead. And... No, I can't. Sorry, I don't want to be the only one. Sorry. If I may venture, uh, you know, an answer or rather uh, a way to think about it. It is intuitive, yes, but I think your intuition can be informed by a lot of the prior work that's happened in the field. And that's the way I think um, I've done my work and I encourage my students, which is don't just, it's very easy to construct a geometric framing for a problem in many different ways, actually. There is never a optimal geometric framing, but uh, some things are naturally expressible and some things uh, become approximations and that approximation side of it is where some of the intuition comes in. And it's, it's very much like the, you know, how you do good work in, let's say, pure math, which is you motivate your work through lots of other work that has happened in the field. It's very rare to, out of the blue, come up with an idea that seems to work. So unfortunately, that means um, it's a lot of study, unfortunately, and that's the barrier that I find. And uh, I am an engineer. I, most of my students are engineers, and the engineering discipline as such does not uh, <laughs> encourage a lot of deep study of mathematics. It's more mathematical than other fields, but geometry is still one of those topics which is well outside the purview of most engineering curricula. But I feel like uh, you know some of the applied papers coming out of ML and vision have been uh, you know, workshops like this one have been very good. And I think they are very valuable uh, for creating more of that intuitive sense of what works when. But I'm not sure if uh, there would be a perfect answer. I'm curious to hear what others think. 
So we don't have many people in dynamics here. Um, unfortunately, I hope to have Dan Kodacek. He tried to, to join, but then he had another, another meeting. But um, so most of you are, are using um, uh, differential geometry for, for machine learning. But in dynamics, of course, in, in framing dynamics in terms of differential geometry is something physicists are doing for, for a long time. And for me, it was more like digging into very old stuff and very, very old stuff at, at some points and discovering that some things have, have been formulated um, and, and are completely not known to, to the robotics um, community. And, uh, uh, you know, bridging between the domains was uh, something. For example, for, for those nonlinear modes, right? We had this idea, then we looked into nonlinear systems, then discovered that in the 1960s, some, some, some people did something in that direction in mechanical engineering. And then even earlier, uh, some mathematicians did uh, uh, things which decoupled from physics for a while, and they studied geodesics with, with completely different terminology, right? And in, interestingly enough, even the mathematicians forgot that their questions about closed geodesic loops came from physics and, and dynamics, right? They are interested by themselves in these problems. So uh, the links got broken over, over the decades, right? And, and uh, finding out what, uh, you know, that, that different names in areas like uh, physics, Hamiltonian systems, mathematics, and engineering refer to the, uh, the same term, uh, well, costed us like one, one year. So it was like digging in a little bit into history of, of uh, physics and mathematics and finding out things. I mean, that's, that, this was my experience in, in robotics. Um, I don't know if, if this is similar in machine learning as well. Probably not because the questions there are newer, I guess. I think in machine learning, there is a lot of intuition that can be gained from, from physics. And uh, I think, uh, well, in, in the past, uh, many of the problems were motivated by the physics or many solutions. And I think now there is a comeback of uh, many um, mathematical tools that are used in, in physics uh, to, to, uh, to machine learning. Well, let's say in, in the field that is called so my heart and genetic deep learning, the gauge theory that, that comes from, from high energy physics is, um, is exactly the same set of tools that, that um, is used to, to, to define probably the most general uh, formulation of uh, of equivariant uh, neural networks. I wanted to, to maybe to say one thing about about uh, to, to the question of how uh, really to, to 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 choose the geometric model. Maybe uh, well, it's a little bit of banality, but uh, you try to model as much as possible uh, to start with uh, about your problem and your setting. And I think there, were, there used to be a saying which, even though despite the the, the the groundbreaking successes of deep learning is probably still valid that, that learning is the second best solution. Uh, so the, the more you, you, you can model and can assume about uh, your problem, the better in most cases, of course, uh, a model that, is, uh, that, that uh, can be constructed by hand doesn't describe all the complexity of your, your data and your problem. So you model as much as possible and then you learn uh, whatever cannot be modeled. Yeah, I, I think I, I want to follow up on, on this particular point. I, I completely agree with that. And that also helps uh, me personally now guide, um, especially what kind of abstractions to use in the robotics problems and what kind of structure, right? So in my particular example, which was all about linking robot control to the topology of knots, right? It was I was really happy to find these uh, right miser rules and all of these things because it provided a structure and a way to abstract um, low level movement policies for robots uh, to it. It was great. So it, it simplified the problem a lot and uh, introduced the structure. So um, that's very high level word on uh, how to pick the geometric model. Maybe okay. if I may, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to say that I want to second that I, my, I'm also, I'm an engineer. I knew nothing about topology and uh, I just kind of embraced it as a, as a tool to provide the right abstractions for my problem. And uh, my problem is multi-agent navigation. And uh, I was thinking about the movements of different entities. And as the entities were moving around, 
uh, I thought of this pattern of the trajectories and then I discovered somehow that there's this whole field called braid theory. Uh, and um, there's a lot of you know, theory there and a lot of stuff going on from the abstract side. But for my particular perspective, I just thought it just made sense for my application to use that. So when I saw the work uh, from your lab, Janet, I, I immediately thought the same thing because I was thinking in some sense, not theory generalizes some of the concepts that braid theory also talks about. So, or there's a lot of linkage there. Uh, I'm not a theoretician, so there's maybe there's different ways to put it in words, uh, but uh, you know, I, 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 I think there's a lot to gain from disciplines like that, that might seem as super abstract in the beginning. Uh, but they can be made so intuitive at the end of the day for applications like like ours. So I guess the question is, what is the recipe for figuring out where to dig uh, when you have an open problem, like, uh, you know, not tying or something? So it's kind of my... Always start with normalizing <laughs> vectors and putting them on spheres, safe bet. <laughs> if that works, I think you can start building on it. I mean, actually, that's actually pretty accurate. Almost everything that <clears throat> uh, could be done with, in between not using geometry and using complicated geometries, I think there is something to be said about spheres. It's a simple geometric thing. It's easy to work with and getting vectorial data onto a sphere is not hard. And it will give you that initial hint that is there any, any hope of doing any more interesting normalizations or constraints. And I've, we've been finding amazing success with just regularizing models with spherical constraints and you know unit norm losses and then building on it to make orthogonality losses. And it seems like, yeah, that would be my initial, if you have no other intuition, go with spheres and build on it. Orthonormality, tori, stuff like that, yeah. So I kind of want to like approach this uh, question from a different perspective rather than like myself, like how do I choose? I think another important uh, part of it is like as Pavan also mentioned, like looking into prior work and trying to distill like the intuition from them. And we've seen that like a lot of success in deep learning actually kind of comes from that direction where there are a lot of people really actively doing very empirical work, even though they may not have the time where they're not interested in investigating in, in the theory, but maybe we can kind of distill what is successful and what they're trying to imply and really like sort of like thinking about problem in that way. And I think important part of that is kind of providing like more empirical people like the really the tool in understanding where how to approach the problem in like the more like geometric and topological way, which it's not a good a, a, like analogy, but like thinking about in the field of deep learning, we have all those open source uh, sort of like libraries for auto diff, uh, which include like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And so that we can have people have very little background we can still like play with those methods and achieve like great empirical success. And we can see uh, what are the things that work in practice and trying to understand. And now we see that even middle schooler who may or may not even know calculus are able to build very complex model and achieve very great performance. And I think that's another like approach we can potentially take. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great theme of like making things accessible and lowering barriers because I think like a common a commonality over a lot of what people have said today is like this kind of stuff is the best when you have other people that are in your area working with you that you like can you can be inspired by or you can inspire etc. And like that's how you make the best science. That's how you make the best engineering. Like um, it seems like it's a pretty common theme amongst all different opinions that like, it's good to have something to work with. It's good for things to be easier to use and it's good for people it to be easier to talk to other people as well. To connect this a bit with the morning, uh, I remember Andrea saying about uh, building those mental models about uh, abstractions. Um, 
and I think besides the mental, the, I guess, I think you said mental images. I remember his beautiful visualizations. And so I think part of the, not problem, but an, an important component here is figuring out the right tools to communicate things to, to people that might be from different audiences or perspectives. And so vi visualizations these days are basically the alpha and the omega of, of things. And so um, I think this is definitely true for concepts like that, that might not be obviously graspable as a first step. And also to follow up on that, I, I don't think we have even the, uh, the, the breakthrough that we need to make, uh, uh, for example, braid theory to be used as PyTorch or TensorFlow, like so that people can code it up that easily. So I don't know what we need there to, to make that happen. If, uh, if we think that this is useful, this is the way to go. I think a bit of a problem here is that um, like, while it's relatively easy to kind of explain a specific work, right? And like in an intuitive manner, for example, explain what I did in this in this paper, um, it takes a little bit more kind of uh, deep understanding if you actually want to develop something else uh, for your specific problem. Like, um, well, you can like, you know, give some intuition and like show nice figures and maybe like, um, uh, get this like high level feeling that, okay, maybe I understand what, what is actually going on. The moment you need to kind of solve your own problem, uh, if you're not looking for kind of out of the box solutions, that's where things get really tricky because uh, sometimes you need to like really understand the theory behind it. And I think this is what uh, makes it a little bit different from learning because learning, I think in, uh, I mean, more people are exposed to it in general. Uh, that's one thing. And another thing is that it maybe requires a little bit less uh, kind of training and, and, and background. Like it's it's a little bit um, more niche, um, with, like the, the stuff that we're talking about here. Would it be worth to connect to the other conversation of the morning about the education? Um, I think this ties well. So th there was a question I, I think uh, Dan Koditsek brought up this, uh, you know, this idea that robotics is a synthetic science, uh, and and that we basically haven't reached the a mature description of what robotics happens to be, right? It's a, it's an emerging discipline that seems to connect uh, very tightly with a lot of other disciplines, uh, and it also reinvents itself, uh, you know, year after year with the advances that we see at conferences. Like it's a very fast-paced field. So are there thoughts on how to uh, approach a common language and a common foundation for what robotics is now, as opposed to what it used to be a few decades ago when it was starting? Well, I guess this is a discussion indeed as long as, as, uh, as robotics and uh... Uh, you know, we had in this 80s this definition of being the intelligent connection of perception and action, which is probably still still valid, and probably it's it's, it's even too broad to to try to to get a very sure. very general definition. But in terms of education, I think the the point for us would be you know how to to bring into engineering curricula and and into computer science curricula some basics of differential geometry, because we see we need it more and more, right? Maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, not many people were talking about differential geometry and, and those few were talking uh, in a very small group, right? So the others could not understand. And this changes in robotics, but still when, when uh, probably also many of you PhD students, you have to learn that by yourself, right? Uh, at least that's the case in Munich and uh, it's, uh, probably we would need some some lectures maybe also as a community right if if uh, some professors in, in university would make those lectures online which are tailored to the needs of robotics as we have mathematics for engineers and we have mathematics for, for uh, informatics for computer scientists right i mean of course you could go in a in a lecture of uh, of differential geometry at the faculty of mathematics but maybe we could have also things which are better tailored for for roboticists, right? I think this would be really, really helpful. I don't know if there exists already something like that. 
Yeah, I really agree with Alan on that because uh, me as a robotics like PhD student was trying to like learn differential geometry, and I had to like go through this like through like a series of three different like mathematical like like courses, including differential topology and all the way to differential geometry so that I can go to like a certain point that I can maybe make some connections with my research. So there's really the gap between like how mathematicians are teaching those like concepts and ideas to like what's really needed by like general like robotics or engineering computer scientists. Um, and people may not have really the time to investigate or like to invest to like really learn those like three different math courses across like a whole academic year just to sort of like understand that so maybe people would choose to do something that's like more accessible to them or have like lower barrier Yeah, and also the likelihood is if you take two different uh, graduate students, for example, in uh, working also in, in with both of them working in robotics, uh, they would probably have taken very different uh, graduate level courses. And so I think that shows that uh, you know we uh, there are there, there is significant advance in the field, yes, but uh, we we can't agree yet on what is important and what is not. Right. I mean, there's a, I mean, this is where I think intuition plays a big role because uh, if material is to be made accessible to engineers, engineers tend to be a lot more intuitive at connecting the dots. So what might be useful for one type of engineer may not necessarily work for another. I, for example, found, you know, Xavier Penex's paper on, you know, uh, a geometric framework for tensor computing, super helpful. That was 10 years ago. Uh, because it boiled down uh, some things about statistics on SPD matrices into a recipe. And when I saw the recipe, I could swap out the details of the specific geometry with another geometry. So that helped me. But again, uh, a lot of other people found that to be not helpful. Uh, we are actually trying it. Arizona State, we uh, are working with a faculty in the School of Math uh, who has dabbled enough uh, in things like radar and engineering side of things that we recognize a need for a class. Uh, what we're doing is a seminar-based class. Rather than lectures, we are saying we're inviting students in who are doing marginally geometric kinds of things in engineering areas. And we have like half the semester covering a few big topics, like yeah, different geometry, topology, you know, homological stuff, simple recipes. And then we want to hear from the students as to what they are doing. So these are not like fresh students who don't know geometry. These are students who have self-taught themselves and are doing stuff anyway, but we want to hear from them about what they're working with. And now we're trying to synthesize what we think they should you know, hear versus what the students are actually doing. It's a process. But I think before we talk of classes and lectures, it might be a few seminars where we invite students who are right now doing in self-learning and finding out what they need. Well, I'm now teaching. Uh, well, first of all, I agree uh, that, that there is definitely a need to, to, to teach geometry. I think uh, it's it's a good question. What kind of geometry and how to teach? But uh, with with my courses, we are now teaching a class on geometric deep learning, building deep learning architectures from, from first principles. So teaching group theory, a little bit of differential geometry, and then uh, assuming that students already know at least uh, some basics of machine learning. So it's not about machine learning is actually connecting the dots. Is the curriculum online somewhere? Just to check it out. We are recording uh, the yeah, it will be published. Great. Yeah, if anyone else in the audience also has opinions about like your experiences as like maybe a roboticist or interested in robotics so far and like what you feel like is really missing, something that you'd like to have not had figured out all on your own at the beginning. Um, be interested to hear perspectives before we wrap up this discussion. So one thing I noticed uh, while maybe the audience is making up their mind uh, is that right now there is a hype on a particular type of method and everything else goes into the background and, and 
lots of students are not even having the necessary background for very basic robotics anymore. So what uh, Anshi, for example, explained really nicely in the beginning of her talk, many students don't even know this anymore, which is very surprising. Um, yeah, so, but that's more of a social aspect, I feel, of this field. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a comment in the chat from Arvin. I'll read it out if that's appropriate. Um, finding proper differential geometry books suitable for engineers is not an easy task, as most of the modern books prefer an abstract level. Of course, one can turn those abstract concepts into computation, but only after spending a certain amount of time spending, uh, getting like deep understanding of those concepts. Uh, however, if one looks at older literature in the community, he slash she can find some books with computational approach. For example, treaties on the differential geometry of curves and services, 1914 by Eisenhardt. I personally like, uh, well, it's uh, from a different domain, but uh, the, 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 the big book of Roger Penrose, The Road to Reality, where uh, he tries to describe all the, the mathematics that underpins modern physics with a little bit of his uh, twist about three stories uh, and a little bit of maybe his diagrams that are not, not very intuitive, but uh, the way that he explains is a very accessible, very intuitive. Uh, uh, so I think this is a, a good uh, book uh, if you want to, to understand uh, also well, both the mathematical uh, concepts uh, to some level of depth, as well as their, their intuition. In my opinion, this is a good reference. So I found, uh, you know, a book that was recently published uh, by Anush Shivastava, one of my collaborators from Florida State, uh, on functional and shape data analysis. It's super specific to functions as time series and you know shapes in the continuous sense. But if you look at the first two three chapters, uh, or even the first one chapter, uh, maybe the second chapter, you know, uh, it is a survey of you know the topics that Mike talked about, right? I mean groups and then invariances and why functional analysis is important and why, what is quotienting? What does invariance mean? Just that one chapter, which is independent of any application and it's very intuitively written uh, with simple shapes and simple figures, but that was, uh, I read a draft of that. I have this inside track that I, I read a draft of that chapter 10 years ago as a grad student. And then the book eventually got published, I think last year or so. So that helped me immensely as an engineer. Uh, I think some of the books that are being written by statisticians are a, are a bit more accessible. Uh, one of the books I read in grad school was uh, Statistics on Special Manifolds by Yasuko Chikusi, uh, all about Grassmannian and Stiefel manifolds, uh, but imposing statistical priors and uh, estimators on uh, these uh, spaces without being very formal about geometry. I mean, Yasuko Chikusi's approach was to treat uh, manifolds as matrix groups. I mean, Stiefel and Grassmannian are special in that sense, uh, but then you can get your leg in the door without getting too formal with uh, geometric uh, you know, abstraction by thinking of these as matrix groups. And that has been helpful. And the book by uh, Optimization on Matrix Manifolds by um, uh, you know, the three authors, I'm, I'm blanking out, I'm, I'll look it up. Uh, uh, that was very helpful. Uh, also the first two, three chapters on how do you compute, what is, the, what is the meaning of a function on a manifold? What is, how do you identify a manifold? If you have a space, what are the tests that you can run through to check if it's indeed a manifold? How do you compute the gradient of a function on a manifold? That's it. And then of course the book is about optimization. I didn't care about optimization as much as that language that I needed. So I feel like there are these introductory chapters in these applied books across statistics, optimization, that that are very helpful. Yeah. Yes, that book. <laughs> Absol, Pierre Antoine Absol, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so another one, maybe uh, talking about manifold optimization. Exactly. So I see somebody commented. Nicola Boumal has a fantastic book about uh, manifold optimization. It's a very good introduction into matrix manifolds, which is probably uh, 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 the kind of manifolds that are most interesting in robotics. Cool, so we're reaching the end of our scheduled day. So we have like 
where we have like basically 10 minutes, which include our award for the submitted extended abstracts, as well as some final words about this. Like, I mean, the point of this workshop is to start building a community or like build a community that's already in the process of coalescing. Um, uh, so uh, no one will speak more about that, but I'm gonna pass the baton to Leonel who will present, uh, explain our process for the best paper award. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, well, as uh, some of you may know, uh, Bosch is sponsoring uh, this workshop uh, by giving uh, an award to, to the best contribution. Um, and uh, basically, just to give you why we do this. So I think on the one hand, um, Bosch is actually uh, really willing to, to support these kind of activities, dissemination activities. And uh, definitely, there is a big interest in the Bosch Center for AI on geometric machine learning and geometric uh, machine learning applied in robotics scenarios. Um, and that's why we actually are trying to, to encourage uh, this kind of events. Um, and this is kind of one way to, to do this. Uh, we did it in the past, uh, in 2020, in one of the workshops that uh, we organized as well in IROS. And uh, this is the second time that we, we really hope to, to, to keep it up. So actually uh, from the organizing committee, we were super, uh, like happy to receive uh, quite a few submissions. And um, and actually the quality was uh, very, very good, uh, I have to say. And um, actually what we did uh, initially was to, to shortlist um, the, the papers, uh, mainly based on the on the reviews that we got. So uh, we not only checked the, uh, the scores, uh, but also kind of the, um, the deep of the, of the reviews, of course, considering that this is a workshop, right? Uh, but this kind of was the first criteria that we used uh, to, to shortlist the, the papers. Um, so out of the 13 submissions that we, we, ha we have accepted here, um, we shortlisted um, four, I think, if I remember correctly. And, um, and after that, um, the process uh, basically involved that every uh, member of the, of the committee will uh, read the, uh, or skim through the papers and watch the, the spotlights. And based on this, um, each uh, member will give um, a rating, probably the two top um, papers that they consider they should uh, be, um, they should deserve the, the, the word. And out of these, uh, we actually made the, the choice. So it wasn't really easy, um, I have to say, but uh, we have to make a decision, right? Um, so please, uh, Noemi, you can uh, disclose who is the, the winner. So yeah, the word goes to, to the paper on sampling over Riemannian manifolds with, with kernel heading, um, um, a paper from, from Sandish, uh, Joshi, and Byron. So congratulations uh, to the authors. I think that Sandish uh, is, is around, right? Uh, yeah, I am. OK, OK, that's cool. So congratulations for the good work. Um, I can just say that uh, uh, the paper is actually very nice. The, the ideas behind, I think, that um, in hindsight might, might look a bit um, um, not not simple, but straightforward. But I think that the way how you address the problem was actually very nice. Uh, the applications and the evaluations that you did uh, in the paper were actually very good as well, um, and they, very insightful. So congratulations for for the good work, uh, and I think that yeah, keep it up. I'm not sure if you, Sandy, you want to 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 say something, but uh, if you want, you're 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 very welcome to. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. This is quite unexpected. I think if anyone was looking at my face, they saw the unexpected nature and like pleasantly being surprised. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. And thank you so much for the support and uh, the encouragement on this work. Sure. Um, all right, and then I think that's, uh, that's it from my side. Um, I guess that will uh, give the, the stage to, to Noemi, who's going to give you some few closing words. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so first, um, it, before closing the workshop, uh, I would like to thank everybody. So this includes the invited speaker who gave great talks, uh, who answered the question in a very nice manner, a very like awesome question and answer that was really nice. I would like to thank all the people who submitted contribution to the workshop. Um, as Leonel just said, there was a lot of contribution that were actually very nice. Uh, thank all of you to also to attend this live session. 
Um, I think we kind of uh, reached the objective of the workshop, which were uh, to connect people from robotics and from other disciplines, and also roboticists that know and that don't know uh, about differential geometry or topological approaches. So, um, yeah, we hope that somehow this workshop can also open the door to continue um, talking about this and maybe to start collaborations um, in order to disseminate somehow those geometric and topological methods uh, for robotics. Um, another thing is that uh, we would like to thank our sponsor, um, the Bosch Center for, for Artificial Intelligence, who provided the awards for the workshop. Um, and one last thing before closing. So with the organizers, we were thinking maybe about proposing a special issue in the journal about um, the topic of geometric and topological methods in robotics. And we would like kind of to gauge uh, the interest of the audience in such a special issue. So if you're interested in that, it would be nice uh, either to raise your hand, to say something in the chat, um, or just to, to speak up. Uh, so we would be very interested in, in knowing if that will interest some of you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> OK, so that's it for our site. Uh, thank you very much for attending. And um, yeah, that was a very nice live session. So thanks to all of you. <laughs>